is hereby called to order. Oh, I'm sorry, I jumped the gun. One minute. This meeting of the Escambia County Board of Adjustments, September 20, 2021, is hereby called to order. With four members present, we have a quorum. Will the clerk please swear in members of staff? Everyone raise your right hand. Show me swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give in this case. Do the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Do affirm. And so you do affirm. Yes, sir. I do. Members of the board, copies of staff's resumes have previously been provided and remain on file for reference. The board has previously recognized staff as expert witnesses. Does anyone have any questions regarding their qualifications and abilities to offer expert testimony? Seeing I, I, none. I have a comment. Yes, sir. Brian Hoffman. I'm counsel for the property owner on the two subject appeals. Yes, sir. You haven't gotten to that point yet, but I want to make clear when you read the port relating to ex parte communication has bearing on what you're making a motion on now about the county staff qualifying as experts. Do you want to wait till we get to that point to address that? That's fine. Thanks. Okay. The, o the BOA meeting package for September 2021 with development services staff's finding of facts has previously been provided to the board members. Chair will now entertain a motion to accept the BOA meeting package into evidence. Do we have a motion? I move we accept. We have a motion, we have a second. I'll second. Motion by Marty, second by Jennifer. Those in favor signify raising your right hand. Passes unanimous. Do we have proof of publication? Yes, sir. Did the publication meet all the legal requirements? Yes, sir. The chair will entertain a motion to waive the reading of the legal advertisement. Do we have a motion? So moved. Motion by Jennifer. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Marty. Those in favor signify raise your right hand. Motion passes unanimously. Members of the board, have you reviewed the resume and transcript for the Board of Adjustment meeting held on September 15, 2021? Upon your review of the resume and transcript, are there any additions, deletions, or corrections? Chairman, I would like to add that the minutes of the previous uh, board case is not on this meeting. It'll be on your normal meeting in October. Okay. As amended. Still need a motion. Motion to accept the minutes as amended. We don't need a motion because the minutes aren't on there. Okay. Good. Yeah, so we can move forward. All right. Good deal. The Board of Adjustment BOA hears administrative appeals, variances, and conditional use requests. These hearings are quasi-judicial in nature. Quasi-judicial hearings are like evidentiary hearings in a court of law, however less formal. All public testimony will be taken under oath, and anyone testifying before the BOA may be subject to cross-examination. All documents and exhibits that the BOA considers are entered into evidence and made part of the record. The giving of opinion testimony would be limited to, to experts and closing arguments will be limited to the evidence in the record. After hearing the testimony and arguments for and against the proposed actions and before its decision, 
The BOA will consider the relevant testimony, the exhibits entered into evidence, and the applicable law. Because decisions of the BOA relating to variances, conditional uses, and extensions of development order for site plan approval are final, uh, are approval are final unless overturned by a competent court jurisdiction. The county may issue development orders and permits for properties in accordance with the decisions of the BOA. However, if applicant requests the issuance of any such order or permit, and such order or permit is issued, the applicant and not the county shall bear any risk that such decision may be set aside, the development or order or permit may be revoked, or the development may otherwise be enjoined by the reviewing court. Any applicant for relief from a decision of the BOA for said actions or any aggrieved party as defined by state law may seek review of such decision by filing an appropriate pleading in a court of competent jurisdiction within 30 days of the BOA decision. To date, whenever the BOA denies an application, no new application for an identical action on the same parcel shall be accepted for consideration within a period of 180 days of the BOA decision. Any person aggrieved by a decision of the BOA relating to an appeal of an administrative decision may, within 15 days hereafter, thereafter, apply to the circuit court for review. Any individual who wishes to speak to the board regarding a particular issue must complete a blue request to speak form and submit it to the clerk of the board. These forms are located at the table in the back of the commission chambers. You will not be allowed to speak until we receive one of these completed request to speak forms. We must have these completed forms for public record. All written or oral communications outside of this hearing with members of the BOA regarding matters under review today are considered ex parte communications. Ex parte communications are presumed prejudicial under Florida law and must be disclosed as provided in the Board of County Commission Resolution 96.13 but before a decision of this board on an administrative appeal, variance, or conditional use request. The chair will ask as each case is heard that any board member who has been involved in any ex parte communications regarding the respective issue to please identify themselves and describe the communication. Before we can address the, uh, the actual issue of the administrative uh, permit, we have a couple of motions that need to be addressed and will be addressed first. We're going to address first the motion for judicial notice, which was filed by W.M. Bell and Company, Inc. And uh, we will ask the party of that to come forward and, and state your uh, rationale. And you're an attorney, sir, I believe. Hoffman? I am an attorney, Brian Hoffman. I represent W.M. Bell & Company, Inc., which is the actual property owner doing business as A-plus mini storage. Mr. One issue before we get Mr. to Mr. Hoffman, excuse me. Yes. Can I interrupt you just you a moment to make an inquiry? Is Mr. Hoffman's uh, client properly before uh, this hearing as I understood, the parties were, uh, and who made the timely filings, uh, were the ones that, are, uh, that were listed. I don't recall a filing made timely within the 15 days. Uh, so I'm just wondering, my understanding was that it was the petitioners and the county. The applicant is not appealing their own development order. Well, my, my question is, 
is uh, is it is this a uh, proper party to be before us? Well, this is singularly the the property owner that's being affected by the decision. I understand that, but I was wondering. Uh, Maybe someone could help me on that. Um, I believe their posture would be as an intervening party, and well, correct. It appears that they would be a party with, with an interest in in both appeals. It would be up to the board whether to accept the intervening party and their motions. And if you wish to make a motion on that, you can. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to move that we, since this is a late comer, uh, I'm going to move that this, uh, these motions by Mr. Hoffman not be heard. May I address that? Yes, not sir. Not be heard. Not, not be heard. Do, yes, sir. Please. I think we need to back up a little bit because, Mr. Goblin, to be honest, that motion, given what occurred here on Wednesday, September 15th, is quite astounding. Just for refresher, on September 15th, Ms. Hostetter came up, and it's a separate appeal, but it's about the same exact issue, and addressed this board for 15 minutes, going through making statements that directly affect the merits of this case if it's not actually addressed on standing. At that point, decisions were made, documentation went to the county, we went through the whole beginning part where you went through and said ex parte. Did anyone have ex parte communication? And I didn't see a single board member raise their hand. Now, the most affected party by this action seeks to file a motion consistent with what the county is, and on your own motion, you're seeking to silence that party. We've got a whole room full of people who want to make comment, and the par property owner is not going to get an opportunity to make a comment. That's about the opposite of due process. And I'm trying to understand a frame of reference where you're coming from because you started with that motion before asking any questions. And I'm curious because it's the exact opposite approach that occurred on September 15th at when, in which multiple ex parte communication occurred. Before it started, for nearly 40 seconds before the meeting, Director Jones addressed Ms. Hostetter, not on the merits, and explained exactly what quasi-judicial is. For frame of reference, that's like court, except it's for local officials. Imagine if you had a divorce or any other proceeding and the singular most affected party wasn't even in the room, never even got notice. Because you waived all the requirements at the beginning about the signs, posting notice of, this, of, of when this meeting's going to occur. But all those discussions were undertaken on September 15th. And right now, we've got pending motions that, in all candor, the reason they were filed at the point where they were is because the county put forth their position. Then the property owner made their position known. Now, you may not agree with what the property owner's position is, but to deny them the due process today to make those motions and those arguments, which when we get into them, are fundamental to public policy in Escambia County. This, the precedent you're setting today far exceeds a tree or what occurs on the property owner's property because it goes to the heart of standing. Those motions address issues in conjunction with what the county raised that are directly relevant. So if you could answer my question, why are you raising that motion on your own without at least hearing the argument of the motion, neither of which are substantial? These are very simple motions. Number one, uh, you will be allowed to address the board on when we get to that point on your the merits of your case well we're at that point uh and uh that's one uh so it's not true you're you're not getting any due process for your client uh, if you cannot address pre-trial, essentially pre-trial motions, whether or not they should go forward, because it's the same fundamental argument the county's making, then you absolutely are being denied due process. The part I'm confused on is why. I'm not, why? Cer I'm not certain I understand your question. Well, there were 15 minutes of conversation that occurred on September 15th without any reservation about whether or not someone had appropriate standing, whether it was appropriate venue. In fact, two, the legal counsel for the board and the director were both advising you shouldn't be having that conversation, but it kept going for 15 minutes. Now we're here today, 
with an opportunity for that to be heard, and you're entertaining a motion that won't let us present the argument? And you don't think that affects due process? The only other point I can make for you is, as I recall the events, uh, the board didn't enter in, into any discussion of the merits uh, at all. Well, that's even more disturbing, Mr. Goblin, because not only that, they took a vote. You voted to make the county experts qualifying experts. Then a decision was made to actually remit materials back to the county. We've never seen a copy of it. That's the importance of the beginning of the hearing when they say what ex parte communication occurred, because without referencing that, there is some confusion about what did or didn't get said. The benefit of it is these initial motions don't deal with that issue at all. If these motions, the ones the county have filed, and our motions get granted, you don't get to that point. And it's important to reference why. These are motions to dismiss. A motion to dismiss standard, what that essentially means is you have an appeal, you take it as written. Assume that what's in that appeal is correct. You don't entertain any evidence, and only by looking at that appeal is it due to be dismissed. If the decision of this board grants that, then there is no entertaining evidence. There is no entertaining any other matters because for, for a reason based on the pleading by itself, it is due to be dismissed. Now, ultimately, you may not agree with it. You may not agree with the property owner's position or the county's position, but why wouldn't you want to hear the arguments? At a bare minimum, it's going to make you substantially more informed if you decide evidence should be taken. That's where I'm confused. Why wouldn't you want the benefit of that knowledge? And for the people in the room. Because I've watched a lot of hearings and discussions on it thus far, and there's a lot of confusion about what we're actually doing here today. So why not have that motion heard? Do you want to withdraw the motion so I can proceed with my motion? Well, we'll, we'll not at this point. The... I, will, I think I'd like to discuss it with the board, but I'm not withdrawing it. Uh, Where we are is uh, we have a motion to deny the intervention, in, introduction of the motion for judicial notice. Well, actually, Mr. Chairman, it's to deny them. Uh, they've come late, as our counsel pointed out. They're an intervening party. In order for them to take part in this proceeding, as I understand it, we have to uh, uh, approve them becoming a party to it. And I think the discussion is really whether or not at this date, late date, uh, uh, we take, uh, allow another party to join, essentially. That's, that's what I understand. Board, uh, just a little historical knowledge on the board itself. Um, not during any of your tenures. I don't. I don't. Not sure if you were here, Mr. Smith. Um, <clears throat> during my tenure uh, serving this board, we have had multiple occasions uh, during appeals when interveners were allowed. We have had the whole standing argument. Uh, it just hasn't happened recently. And as a and, and as a director. Um, I do concur with Mr. Andrews' uh, statement. He should be aware. Yes, there have been there have been lawyers intervening on the behalf of the client, and 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 and, and they're just asking to be a party just to address the board. Um, there have been several cases, and I've been to, and, I, and I've been in two many appeals. Uh, so yes, presidents has been established by this board. No, not at this time. Who no, ma'am. I don't. I don't think I recall. Uh, I need to. I need to get on the record responding to his statement. Miss Miss Hofstetter, I, I, I in just a, in just a moment, ma'am. You what, let let us get through this, and um, then. May I speak to this issue? No, though, not, not, not now. Not until it's your you time. Decide? Not until it's your time. Everyone takes turns. Okay, I'm sorry. Is there an opportunity for me to speak? 
Sure. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I'm willing to, or would suggest that whatever we want to do, we want to make sure there's no uh, lack of due process in this for anybody. I would suggest that we hold Mr. Hoffman in abeyance and then move on and wherever we wind up at the end, then he be uh, at that point, then let us entertain uh, his motions. Well, that's actually worse than denying it because the whole purpose of the motion is to address it before you get to the points of evidence. Are we going to... Before we get to the point, are you saying defer the, the motions to the end, but la allow the whole matter to go to, or possibly to evidentiary before you actually deal with the pre-evidentiary matters? I'm trying to help you, Ms. Tomlin. But you're not. That's the part where I'm confused. Well, then. Uh, I mean, right now you've been told by staff that the precedence that's established by this board is to allow intervening parties to actually make motions that are at issue. Why are we departing from established precedents? If there's a rule you're citing to, what rule are you citing to saying that you can't allow intervening parties to make an argument? Because right now the precedent of the board, by what staff has just told you, is to allow that to occur. I'd like to hear from our, our board's attorney as to this matter. I, I think it would be ill-advised to not allow the property owner to intervene. To, to not allow the, you and I would have to concur they with that. Are, are, are you stating, Michael, they came late to the game because of? I think technically M Michael's correct, but what we're trying to do is due process. We have, we have to establish substance uh, for these folks and uh, I think this is the beginning of it and I, I see nothing wrong with allowing it. I agree 100% you're correct that technically uh, they didn't file in time. But the property owner is not filing an appeal. Right. That's where that deadline right. comes into play. But the property owner is late to this proceeding, and it is an intervener, and the board has the authority to accept interveners or not. I just want to be sure that legally I'm correct on that. Am I? Yes, sir. But, but what are we late on? Is there a rule for timing for an intervening party? No, there is not. No, there's, there's no rule. I'm just saying that's the factual setting. And you're, the property owner is certainly a party with an interest in this proceeding. Uh, and I would grant that too. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll go ahead and I'll withdraw my motion. I would anticipate that we would, after we hear the motions, we will hear from other council on, I'm sure that there will be comments. Uh, I'll, I'll withdraw my motion, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. And I think, though, I think we should formally vote, though, to allow uh, the property owners to intervene. You would like to make that motion? Yes, Mr. Chairman. I'll go ahead and allow Mr. Hoffman's client uh, as an intervener. I'll second. Any discussion? Those in favor Excuse signify. Me. Is the public and the applicant allowed to address this request, this uh, motion before you vote? Well, we have to hear Mr. Hoffman before we can uh, have him. I made a statement very critical, and I'd like to respond before you vote about me and the, and the ex parte situation. Please since let me address since, your since it's not in order, we're going to let you speak after we vote. After I, after you vote? Uh, yes, if you want to speak then. 
Fine. And, if you don't, don't. At that point, you'll be able to speak to the merits of what Mr. Hoffman has to present. Right now, we're just formally allowing him, uh, his client, to intervene in these proceedings. Okay, Am I not correct, Mr. Hoffman? Motion to dismiss. Thank you. I will speak after he makes his motion. Okay. We have a motion. We have a second uh, to allow the admission of a motion for judicial notice. Those in no, favor signify. I don't believe that was the motion. You said motion again. for judicial notice. I think, Mr. Godwin, your motion was to allow the You're property You're right, in order to get him in the game. To intervene. Okay. okay. And now we have, Mr. Hoffman has a motion. Thank you. There are two motions. Well, I'm sorry, vote. was there a vote? No. no. Those yes. in favor vote. signify raise your vote. Passes unanimous. Thank you. There are two motions that the property owner has filed. Both go hand in hand. And I want to frame the issue so you understand why these are significant, because they also go to the heart of what the county has filed, which is a standing issue. Right now, the standing that is applicable for this appeal is that it actually affects in kind different than degree. What that means is, is that if you have an adjoining property owner, if you have someone who suffers a harm different from what a member of the general public would, then that is the gateway to standing. Is, it, is in contrast to in kind, which could be compared to, for example, in the case of the tree, I care more about trees than another person in the community does. That would not be a viable basis for standing. Under the code, that is the gateway to what allows an appellant to come before this board. And if you look at what the county filed in their motion, they cited three of the prior appeals last year that went before the board. One on the beach access, which dealt with an adjoining property owner. Another one dealing with road access, where the party was being affected by the access to the road that was being uh, addressed. And then another one where an adjacent property owner was building a large structure. If this board does not limit it to standing, then that means essentially every time a development order is entered or any other action occurs, you're going to have a full-blown evidentiary hearing. That's the essence of what the county filed, and it's correct. And I think there's one point of distinction that needs to be made on that. That is what the law is right now. A lot of the people who've become very vocal and there's nothing wrong with getting vocal in support of the environment, in support of trees. I think there's been a lot of dialogue that has occurred that maybe at some point the county revisits what its requirements are for a tree ordinance or what its requirements are for standing. But the law as written is what the Land Development Code says now. And I think some people may not like it. I think that's a fair statement. But those are the rules that govern it. This is not a legislative body. This is not a body that gets the ability to listen to the input of people in the audience and say, you know what, let's change the laws. Just like a court officer is, you're bound by what the law is, whether you like it or not. And a key component of the current land development code, 2-6.10, is standing. Now, the public policy reason behind it is if you do not create a standing basis, it's legitimately an impediment to allowing development orders or other county activity to occur. That's fundamental. What's unique about the motion we have filed with respect to the Emerald Coast Keepers Inc. complaint is very simple. And it goes hand in hand with motion to dismiss and the motion for judicial notice. There is no entity called Emerald Coast Keepers Inc. I don't know if that's a typo or is intended to be another entity, but there is no entity on file with the Florida Secretary of State that is for that entity. And for that reason, a corporate entity is like a person. When no identifiable entity filed within the 15-day period, there was no jurisdiction created by this body. For the very reasons you had concerns about an intervening party. We're not bound by those same rules because we're not the appealing party, but it did not occur within that 15-day window. The motion for judicial notice proceeds under the evidence code under 9202, which is a Florida statute, which is saying that if facts are readily apparent and known from uncontested sources, like the Secretary of State's website and its records, 
that confirmed that the entity that filed is not an existing entity, that this body acknowledged that. And for that reason, that appeal has not been timely filed because it's by an entity that does not exist. Now, I think one point on that that you need to address is, is, well, did they make a typo or not? It's kind of a good question. And there's a tendency to say, well, of course they did. But if you read the appeal that's filed, that's where you'd have problems. It doesn't reference address. Mr. Dunaway, the party representing that entity, when it was before the Development Services Committee, his statement is he represents concerned citizens. After that meeting, he sent a letter where he once again referenced representing a concerned citizen, not that actual entity. That kind of goes hand in hand with the standing argument because if I accidentally misspelled my name and I've been sitting in it every single one, the argument kind of is, well, of course that's Brian Hoffman. He's been sitting here for all the prior hearings. But when you have a standing problem, particularly when someone's not even at prior hearings indicating who they represent, then you're left with a name that doesn't comport with any entity on file. We are requesting that that reason is jurisdictional. And with reference to appeals, I think some framework on how an appeal works would be helpful. I think a lot of people in the general public don't realize it. That after you have a decision in a court, there's a time period with, 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 within which a notice of appeal can be filed. If you miss it, you're done, as a lawyer would say. The reason why is you have not invoked jurisdiction. The authority under the law for a court of law, court of appeal, to hear it means you have to invoke jurisdiction with a time period. Now let's say you do invoke jurisdiction, and then you file your appeal, life happens, let's say it's a pro se person or represented by counsel, and you can't timely file a brief within the required time period. Like the concern you were addressing a minute ago. If something's within the jurisdiction of a body, if jurisdiction has been invoked, then you have discretion to allow for how you're going to handle it. But if the jurisdiction was never invoked in the beginning, meaning no identifiable corporate entity filed any appeal on that first one within the 15-day window, then it should be dismissed. Because the only way you're going to identify who that party is is to possibly get testimony, get commentary. Well, the problem with appeal is you're limited with the record. What's in the record? And there's nothing in the record to identify who the party is. For that reason, that motion should be granted. Motion for judicial notice should also be granted. But I think another key point is it's not a distinct argument from what the county's arguing. It goes hand in hand with the standing argument. And right now, Escambia County has made the decision that this is not going to be ground zero for every political debate. That's what would occur. Every time a development order got issued, whether it was supported by 90% or only 10%, this forum would become the launching point for commentary on whether or not a code or any other provision should be changed. That's not the purpose of this board. That's not the purpose of a quasi-judicial board. And that doesn't mean that people's comments aren't valid. If these motions get granted, I've got no objection on behalf of my client if every single person in this audience comes up and states their opinion on where trees should fit in, what the ordinance should be, what standing should be. They're citizens of this community. They deserve a voice for that. But citizens of the community also deserve the respect due the law, which is when something moves forward, we're going to operate that the land development code, whatever the rules in place, are what control. If you apply the existing land development code and standing requirements, then the motions we have filed should be granted. The motions the county have filed should be granted. And that's not an endorsement by this board about whether or not the tree should be removed at all. I want to be clear on that. It may be a little unfair if people volunteer to serve on the Board of Adjustment only to get blamed for where the law should be in some people's eyes relative to where it is now. You bear the burden many judges do. Judges don't always like the rulings they have to make, but they do have to enforce the law. As it stands right now, there is no corporate entity that exists as named in that first appeal. The records maintained by the Florida Secretary of State are unequivocal on that point as far as the identification of the entity. For that reason, it should be dismissed because 
no identifiable entity has filed. And there's no way to answer that question by reviewing the record. As to those two motions, that is our argument. Are you suggesting that the original applicant for the, for the appeal not be allowed to uh, state uh, their, their official standing? I think that the party absolutely has a right to respond to what I've just said. I'm not going to make arguments to you that I should be able to speak and then he should not have an opportunity to come up here and speak. However, it should be limited on the issue about what, exactly what entity is being represented and whether or not that entity exists before you get to anything else. Because there's a tendency, based on a lot of people in the room, I think they want to go straight to the merits. you got to deal with this issue first on this first appeal about whether or not an entity that exists actually filed one. May I make a motion? Yes. Well, actually, I, I think we, Mr. Dunaway, did you intend to have a response? Mr. Chairman, may I address the question directly? Sure. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Godwin. I certainly would like the opportunity at the appropriate time. I believe Ms. Hofstutter was, uh, had been recognized first, but I certainly would like to address it. Thank you. Uh, well, what, 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 Ms. Hofstetter is not a party to that appeal. Well, Ms. Hoffman is correct. We are on uh, Ms. Dunaway's case, I think. Mr. Chairman, thank you. And thank you. And for the record, uh, my name is Will Dunaway, and I represent the Emerald Coast Keeper, Inc. If I may, Mr. Godwin, remove my mask. Um, so I'm playing catch up here. <laughs> this is a, the Board of Adjustment. I'm here before you because I made an application on behalf of Emerald Coast Keeper. Apparently, there, we're arguing, I think what Mr. Hoffman is talking about is a, is a S. So apparently, he filed a motion on Friday at what time, Ms. Johnson? 4.37. 4.37 p.m.? Yes. So on Friday, at 4.37 p.m., Mr. Hoffman filed a motion to dismiss, and I think that's the motion that is now called up before you. I apologize, Mr. Chairman, because I was in Kansas City attending the wedding of my nephew. Nevertheless, um, having now just reviewed it, it does appear that we are talking about a comma. Emerald Coast Keeper, Inc. is my client. I, in my petition, put an S and said Emerald Coast Keepers, Inc. Emerald Coast Keeper is a recognized entity under Florida, the Secretary of State. I have the SunBiz called up uh, here with their principal point of address. And so I think that we ought to go back to, because again, sometimes board members, you, you know this, um, when we have proceedings before you, Sometimes when lawyers come before you, they, they get, we get into form over substance. I mean, this is a volunteer board. You are a volunteer board. These are all citizens of this community. You have a professional staff who's trying to do an important business. We're simply trying to move forward with important issues. So I'd like to go back to what Mr. Hoffman said when he first got up and he said, I think everybody ought to be heard. I completely agree with you. I completely agree with you. You need to hear what the people have to say about this particular issue. You need to hear whether staff, in this case, administered the code, your code, the code that you are responsible for ensuring is followed, was followed in this case. And, and if it was, this is a quick hearing and we'll be done. And if it was not, it'll be a quick decision and we'll be done. The appeal process, if you will, again, it's important to point out. And uh, Mr. Dunaway, I think we're Mr. Dunaway. I'm sorry, Ms. If, if we could just limit limit to standing, to yes, ma'am. Motion for judicial, yes, a absolutely. I, well, we're, we're not here in the case right now. No, ma'am, not at all. So if we could um, just limit it to this motion. And I, I believe this motion is the motion to dismiss my client, such that if there are three votes. 
because today you have a quorum of four, so it takes a majority to take any action. So I think Madam uh, Council would agree with me that it'll take three votes to make a decision. But if there are three votes that grant Mr. Hoffman's motion, the one we're addressing right now, mm -hmm. then my client and I will have to leave because we'll be done. So that, it, we're not talking about the motion for judicial notice. We're talking about the motion to dismiss my client. Well, I'm talking about no. the motion for judicial notice, notice right now because that is what Mr. Hoffman has brought up at this point in time. Well, I'm going to let Mr. Hoffman clarify because I okay. read it differently. You're correct. It is a motion for judicial notice. I also gave the context of the motion to dismiss. But right now, the motion for judicial notice is asking for confirmation by this board that Emerald Coast Keepers, Inc. does not exist. Right. And which that's, that's was like essentially to conceded to by Mr. Dunaway. Right. I, Mr. Uh, Ms. Toppin, uh, I think we're, if I understand what you're saying, your motion, the one we're discussing now is strictly limited, at least it is in my mind, to whether or not uh, there is an entity the, uh, that is a party to this proceeding. Is that right? No, it's, it's a determination that Emerald Coast Keepers, Inc. doesn't exist in Florida. I know that. In other words, that it's not an entity uh, that's your argument, correct? Correct. And that it is not, an, I presume, an, uh, a nonprofit corporation under Chapter 617? That, well, right? the treatment under the tax code of an entity is not going to be necessarily public record. Uh -huh. But I think if we're breaking these out, Ms. Bass's comment is correct. That That's the first motion, motion for judicial notice, to confirm Emerald Coast so, Keepers, Inc. does not exist. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank so you. So if you want to deal with that motion first, then we can address the motion. Yeah. Yes, yeah. and I I'd like to keep it one motion at a time so we don't get confused here. Thank you, Ms. Bass. And, and again, <laughs> thank you. Uh, and thank you to Ms. Johnson for allowing me to see that motion. So I thought he was just filing a motion for judicial notice for the record on the 15th. Fine, understood. The motion, the judicial notice is that Emerald Coast Keepers with an S, Inc., does not exist. Emerald Coast Keepers with an S does not exist. It's Emerald Coast Keeper Inc. My client has always been Emerald Coast Keeper Inc. There's an S on my appeal. It is not determinative here. You can hear and you can determine that we're not, mis we're not misrepresenting to you. Nobody was, has been prejudiced. No one is harmed by the fact that I said my client was Emerald Coast Keepers as opposed to Emerald Coast Keeper, it's a form over substance. Certainly, again, back to Mr. Hoffman's first uh, comment, everyone ought to be heard. In this circumstance, certainly it ought to be heard under the situation where I write Emerald Coast Keepers as opposed to Emerald Coast Keeper, filed the appeal with the county and that then got a motion on Friday before the hearing that there was an S and it shouldn't have been an S. I, that's, a simple, that's a simple vote. I urge you to vote to allow my client to proceed with its appeal. Thank you. Ms. Toppin, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Ms. Dunaway. So essentially you're saying that uh, you made a uh, of Scribner's error, error. In, in writing an S instead of a, a one. And nobody's misunderstood. When you go to Sunbiz and type Emerald Coast Keeper, you see Emerald Coast Keeper, comma, Inc. You see a fully formed entity. It's fully formed in the state of Florida. There is no Emerald Coast Keepers with an S, but nobody was confused. It couldn't possibly have been confused. No one is mis, uh, has been misdirected. Uh, no one has been, you know, we're not like holding or covering your eyes. It's, we're open and clear. I mean, right. it, Ms. Toppin, did you want to? The, the only point I want to raise is one comment about my position as far as letting people speak. There's a difference between the applicant putting on a case where they present evidence and allowing members from the general public to comment. 
um, whatever the ruling is, we don't have a problem if members from the general public comment. That's different from the moving party seeking to put forth evidence. And because that entity does not exist, and the relevance is in the record, can you figure out what the entity is by looking at the record? And you can't. That entity is not referenced at all in the transcript. No iteration of it. That's a problem. If this precedent is allowed, what that means is you can put a name down, and arguably you could change the name before you come in here. I mean, it's, it's a substantial issue with an appeal, and it goes hand-in-hand hand with the standing argument because you normally wouldn't have that. Normally, if I've been in every process as an individual, I'm known from the beginning. But if entities are allowed to come in and then argue when there's no actual standing, it's a problem. And the reason why I make that distinction is, you know, for the, for the judicial notice motion, it's pretty cut and dry. I mean, it's, he's already conceded that the entity doesn't exist. And if that's the issue we're addressing first, then that's, that motion is due to be granted. But what is your feeling on Ms. Dunaway's assertion that this is, was a Scrivener's error by him in the plea? It's jurisdictional. I gave the explanation at the beginning to explain that if, the, the, if this board's jurisdiction gets invoked, you have discretion. When Where? the jurisdiction has not been invoked, you have a problem. And within the 15-day period, an entity that exists had not filed an appeal. So you would have us dismiss this if, indeed, the evidence shows that a Scribner's error was the reason that... Uh, well, the issue goes hand-in-hand hand with standing. Right now, if you consider evidence, you are not following the standing requirements. This, this whole provision about the name of the entity more or less just puts an exclamation point on the standing issues that the county's already filed. You're opening the door to allowing appeals where names can be changed, even if it's a Scrivener error, because if you ever spend time on some biz, then there's many, many names. You could argue a Scrivener's error all day long about what an entity's provision is. There's many of them. That name does not exist. But more importantly, if you read the appeal as written in the record, it doesn't establish how there's any standing. It doesn't even entertain it. Normally, if someone's going to file appeal, just like the three you dealt with last year, they're going to explain, hey, that development you're doing affects the road. I'm right next to the beach access. You're building a multi-structure story right next door to me. The very essence of their appeal explains who they are because it explains how they have standing. The appeal that's been filed in this case doesn't raise any of that because there is no standing. That's why it, when it comes to the issue about an incorrect name, it's not, it's not minor. It's, it's one entity exists and another does not, and if one that exists did not file within the 15-day period, then this board's jurisdiction to deal with it has not been invoked. Thank you. I yes, believe uh, board members, we're at the point that uh, we need a motion or seek a motion to either uh, grant the motion for judicial notice or deny it. Can, can I ask Mr. Dunaway a question? Mr. Dunaway, I read the transcript of the DRC uh, meeting that, that you had, and I believe you, you were there, not you had, but the DRC had, and you were there. Was there anyone there from Emerald Coast Keeper? Uh, Mr. Chairman, may I address the question directly? Yes, thank you, Ms. Bass. Ms. Bass, at the uh, DRC hearing, I was representing some concerned citizens that later then became, came together and hired me as Emerald Coast Keeper. So was Emerald Coast Keeper as an entity there, uh, not in an official capacity? I would point out, however, that that's not required for uh, filing an appeal with this BOA. I would also like to point out that your staff and your staff's attorney filed the motion for standing, that is, to allege that Emerald Coast Keeper did not have standing without raising any issue between the S or not an S. So we certainly understand that we have the hurdle to get over with regards to standing, the issue of the hurdle of actually the difference between an S and whatnot seems to be because we're concerned from the applicant from, from, the, um, from the property owner that we might actually have standing if we showed up as Emerald Coast Keeper. But in any event, we 
believe that we are properly here. We believe that we, would ha we should have the opportunity to uh, address you with regards to the issue of standing, and we are prepared to do so. Thank you. Okay, so at the DRC meeting, you represented some concerned citizens, correct? Correct. Not Emerald Coast Keeper. I had not been engaged by Emerald Coast Keeper at the date of the DRC, correct. Okay. All right, thank you. Any more questions? Sir, would it be appropriate for me to speak regarding the accusation of uh, ex parte communications at this point? Should we allow her? I think Is this regarding the notice of judicial motion for judicial notice? I believe it may because Mr. Hoffman, may I speak from the microphone? I urge you to maintain your discussion regarding the motion for judicial notice. I have not seen a copy of the motion for judicial notice. The only notice I've seen from Mr. Hoffman came to my email at 4.57 on Friday afternoon. And I'm prepared to speak to that motion when the time comes because he was uh, making motion to dismiss okay. my case. Thank but you. I am here to speak at this moment, if I may, because my name was uh, brought up in Mr. Hoffman's presentation regarding his motion as that my statements and appearance before this board at, at your last meeting on September 15th violated ex parte communication that is what he said. Okay. That I, I believe think, is a part. I don't think this is the time. I don't think this I is think the time. I think this is his motion, ma'am. May I continue? And if it isn't the time, they have spoken at great length, and I was promised I could speak in response to my name being invoked and the question of ex parte communication. Actually, Ms. Hofser, you will have a full and fair hearing your case will be following this he one. is uh, sir he's asking that um you all had violated ex parte communication by uh, by my speaking at the hearing on the 15th that is what i just understood him to say and we will discuss and that and i'm discussing it now because it makes we every we will discuss that okay. on we're, your we're case not gonna, we're not going to yeah. have we will you certainly do that you may be seated and we'll call you when your case is up right, I was asking for you to invite witnesses, which was your authority. We did your not make any mention up, of anything regarding us. this case at that meeting. Therefore, it was not ex parte communication. Uh, board members, any other questions? The chair seeks a motion either grant the motion for judicial notice or to deny the motion for judicial notice. Mr. Chairman, I move that we move uh, to accept the judicial notice and I ask that the board have discussion before the vote. Mr. Chairman, I, I for one, uh, can't support this and the reason being is, is that uh, I accept Mr. Dunaway's argument that this is a Scribner's era and for the case to fall, uh, I'm not sure how I, the merits of the case, I'm not sure how I feel about them. Of course, I haven't heard the evidence. But for it to fall on essentially what uh, an officer of the court has told uh, this board, 
uh, is the result of uh, just an era. Uh, I think that's just too harsh of a remedy, and I, I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to support uh, Mr. Hoffman's motion. And, and I, uh, I agree with Michael. Uh, the, plus, it's you know basically this, this stops, this stops it. So other, others don't get input and don't get to talk about the lack of standing. And uh, I agree with Michael. I also agree. Uh, I don't believe the technicality of this nature uh, merits. Um, uh, dismissal of this case. Okay. I would also like to take it further in. No, uh, bear in, and bear in, yeah. bear in mind, this yeah. is strictly addressing the motion for judicial notice. Yes. There is a separate motion to dismiss that raises other issues. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah, cor correct, because the right. wherefore, it, you're essentially confirming that entity doesn't exist. There's also a motion to dismiss. If you decide to grant or deny that motion to dismiss, because we haven't argued that one yet, we're just arguing right now on the motion for judicial notice that that entity doesn't exist. I've told you that. Mr. Dunaway's told you that as well. He said Scribner. You've indicated that you accept it to be a Scribner's issue, but that doesn't change the fact that if you grant the judicial notice, you're not actually ruling on the motion to dismiss. That would be separate. Thank you, Ms. Taufman. So. You, we have a motion, but you're withdrawing the motion to accept and make it a motion to deny. Actually, I was looking um, for a vote on on whether we accept my motion or deny my motion. Uh, I can I can withdraw that motion if that's the better way to carry well, it out. It doesn't have yeah. a second. That does it then. So motion fails. Well, Mr. Chairman, I'll move that we deny the judicial uh, notice uh, motion by Mr. Hoffman. I'll second. We have a motion. We have a second to deny the motion to for judicial notice. Any questions, comments? All those in favor signify raising your right hand. Councilor, I believe that uh, next uh, uh, presentation would be uh, the motion to dismiss for lack of standing, and that would be by the uh, Escambia County Development Review Committee administrative body. Do you have any problem with that? No, I do not. It, it's certainly um, the okay. will of the board, how they wish to proceed. Mr. Chairman. Kia Johnson on behalf of the DRC. Mr. Hoffman also filed his own motion to dismiss if the board would like to address that before moving to my motion to dismiss. What are the differences between Mr. Hoffman's motion really and yours? I would like to give Mr. Hoffman the opportunity to, extend, to explain that. He does adopt my standing arguments, but his motion goes further. We can, uh, we can. I can clarify that. You've essentially made a ruling on it. The way, she, uh, the way Ms. Johnson filed the motion to dismiss, we adopted those arguments. So we would like an opportunity to comment on the standing. But the remainder of the motion to dismiss was premised on the issue with the fact that that name doesn't exist. There is no entity. So I interpret that your fact that you deny the motion for judicial notice, that you're also going to deny the motion to dismiss. However, I just want to clarify. It also incorporates standing arguments that Ms. Johnson raised. So I would like the opportunity to comment on that, but only after she makes That'll her be presentation. Fine. Ms. Hoffman, that, that seems like a very good workable solution. Okay. Uh, and I, and I, uh, we would certainly look forward to that. Do, uh, do we want to go ahead and, and uh, let uh, Ms. Hoffman make a presentation? We don't have to have the county next. Well, well I, I think standing. I think the uh, I believe Ms. Hoffman just said that he would essentially, and I, please don't let me put words in your mouth that 
basically the county and he adopted their position and that he simply uh, said that he would like after the county presents to be able to make his own presentation. I've got no issue with the order. If you'd that's rather a, me go first, I will. That's okay that. then. We will move forward with the county at making their presentation. May I ask a question about procedure here? And may I? Yes. Ms. Hofstetter, I don't ever think you've been sworn since No, I haven't. Thank you. That's one of the procedures. <laughs> May I be sworn in at this point? <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, Ms. Hofstetter has made a lot of statements. We need to be able to have them uh, uh, under oath. You might uh, go ahead and be sworn in. Raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony about you in this case? I do. Please state your name. Margaret Hostetter. You might make a uh, statement, if you will, please, that the comments you made before you were sworn in, you stand by and, <coughs> and you acknowledge affirm. them. Thank you, uh, Mr. Smith. Um, yes, I made the statements regarding um, the accusation that my meeting my attending your last board meeting September 15th um, was not ex parte communications as Mr. Hoffman accused, thereby insinuating that you all have no right to even sit here and judge this or consider this hearing. And the reason it was not ex parte communication is because, as I mentioned, on that day, your board procedures, according to the Land Development Code, allow you, as board members, to authorize my request for witnesses to be called for my case. And it is only you that can off, uh, authorized that by going through the procedure I mentioned, which is requesting that the administrator um, require or uh, the witnesses that I wish to bring today attend. I can't require that. I can't, sum I can't summon witnesses. You could have possibly gone through that process, and that was my point was a point of process. We spoke of nothing regarding the case. We spoke of nothing but the fact that I had realized, because I had received an email from Ms. Johnson in response to my um, request for certain members of staff to be uh, uh, able and ready to appear today for my hearing, and she explained that they don't have to attend. And in fact, you can't subpoena staff to attend and speak in this hearing. So that is the reason I came at that, and I had heard that I had gotten her email the night, the evening before, almost five o'clock, the night, the day before I came down here at 8:30 in the morning with this request. So my my comment was, and this is a very critical one, that that request I made of you was not ex parte, it did not, when you decided not to um, do as I requested and ask Mr., uh, Mr. Marino, the administrator, to instruct the staff who are under his control to be here if I wish for Ms. testimony today. Ms. Hoff Ms. Yes. Hofstetter, we're getting off. Okay, well, You're it's just ex parte. You're actually arguing your own, your merits of your own case. Uh, I understand that you don't believe, if I understand what you essentially said, the ex parte communications matter, the more I hear about it, if it's going to be an allegation and this thing goes to an appeal, then we ought to have something on the record about it. I'd like to hear from Mr. Hoffman on how we engage in an ex parte communication. Thank you, we sir. We understand that you think you didn't engage in it in a public okay. meeting. Thank you. 
therefore, but as to not being able to call staff and all that sort of thing, that's okay. not really germane to where we are. Yes, it kind sir. of muddies our waters in, gotcha. right now. Okay, thank you. Thank if you. Mr. Hoffman could explain what he meant, thank you. Ms. Thompson, I would like to hear how we violated uh, procedure and made ex part of that ex parte communications were heard. Can we do that during her case? Uh, I'd like, well, since we've gotten into it, I'd like to hear it now before we get into Ms. Johnson, who I'm sure is going to have a lengthy exposition. And, uh, and I didn't realize it was a cloud, but apparently it is. So, Mr. Chairman, if it's, that's just, well, I'm one person and that's my fault. Well, but I would like to know how we are violated. We're, Board, bear in mind, in the event there is ex parte communication, your obligation in order to remove any presumption of prejudice is to disclose that. And you, you all do that for each case. That case has but, not been called, and your opportunity would be to simply mention that on the record and allow any other interested parties the opportunity to, to ask questions. Well, that actually was part of Mr. Hoffman's central presentation just a minute ago. Yes, I understand, but I'm just pointing out that if there was any claim of ex parte communication, that's, I don't believe that there was some suggestion that you are now not allowed to hear this case today. Ms. Hoffman, could you come forward and explain how we were in violation? Well, I, I agree with Ms. Yule's comments. Um, the reason I addressed ex parte at the beginning was because you were entertaining a motion that would not allow the property owner to address. And I referenced the fact that that had previously occurred on the 15th. I don't think the ex parte issues are relevant to the motion that's been filed by the county in either case. And specifically, Ms. Hostetter's appeal isn't the one up right now. So I can address that now, but I think you're probably gonna be better dealing with the pretrial issues because the issue with ex parte only becomes an issue if you're actually considering evidence. If, if, if the motions for standing that the county have filed get granted, then whether there was or was not ex parte communication is moot. So if you want me to address it now, I will, but if you're trying to put things in logical order, I would probably start with the pretrial motions first. Well, it was the central part of your presentation. No, it wasn't. The well, reason did I, did I mishear you then? You, you did because they, it's central to my presentation on the fact that the property owner should be allowed to speak. If you're going to have hearings previously where people can address the board, it just is a mere matter of equity. Why wouldn't the property be owner be afforded the same? But if you want to address the issue of ex parte, let's start with the definition. Because when you say ex parte, there's a tendency to think, well, someone did something wrong. They did something with malice intent. That doesn't mean that at all. That simply means that outside of these proceedings, communications occurred about the case. That occurred on September 15th. If you read the transcript, you can watch the video, it's available. You know, for about 40 seconds before it even started, there was communication between Mr. Jones and Ms. Hostetter in which he explained this is a quasi-judicial proceeding. It's very different than going down and talking to the county staff if you've got a concern or issue, because this is like court. And the significance about what occurred on Wednesday is that there was no notice to the county. Ms. Johnson wasn't present. The property owner wasn't present. The general public wasn't present. They were considering, they were considering a, an issue about the billfish. Part of fundamental due process is that everybody knows what's actually occurring. All the people from the general public behind me weren't present because the meeting had been noticed for September 20th, not the 15th. Now, beyond that, exactly what should be done because ex parte communication occurred is a much more complicated question. I think that's more appropriately dealt with after Ms. Johnson makes the motion for the county. If at that point the county denies that motion, at which point you're arguably going towards evidence, then I think it makes sense to address the ex parte issues. But to do that right now, you're dealing with essentially evidence issues before you've dealt with the motion that could address standing before any evidence gets presented. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. 
Mr. Chairman, may, be our, may I be heard on this issue of ex parte? Yes, sir. <clears throat> um, thank you. I, I like Mr. Um, Godwin am a bit concerned about it too because um, members you know that from here there are two paths forward um, either way I mean whatever decision is made today um, and that those two paths are a writ of cert to a circuit court or a uh, determination of inconsistency under 163 32 15 uh, both of those paths are appeals from this uh, board's actions here. And, and here we are building the record for that. So however you, you, you determine today, um, whether that is you side with, uh, with the, the property owner or whether you would side with one of those who have appealed, uh, the potential for that further proceedings exists. So if you are making, and, and I completely agree uh, with Mr. Hoffman on this point, if you are making decisions in your quasi-judicial role, which you are, you are a quasi-judicial body, and those decisions go to the issue of whether my client or whether other uh, persons coming before you have the right to be before you, uh, then I would think that it would be appropriate for us to address the issue of ex parte. I mean, clearly something happened. Again, I wasn't here on the 15th because, as Mr. Hoffman correctly noted, in my case, this case, was not before you. But if something did occur, then, as Ms. Ewell simply said, you heard something. Uh, the question that I would, I would just put on the record is, Having heard something about this case that was not uh, that, that was not before you at that time, are you able to make a fair and free decision here today? And if the answer is in the affirmative, then I think we've handled the ex parte. Thank you. May I comment on that? Yes, sir. Um, as I recall, at that meeting, both county staff and county attorney, on numerous occasions. Uh, told this board um, that uh, that communication wasn't proper. And I don't recall us um, engaging in that conversation other than to tell Ms. Hostetter that it was inappropriate um, and that she should, uh, and, and, we, and we did not take action on, on her request uh, to demand certain staff to be here. So I don't believe that um, there was any ex parte. I don't believe it was a conversation back and forth. I think it was one way. We asked her numerous times to sit down and she continued to talk. But her talking toward us doesn't mean, in my mind, that we had a conversation with her. Thank you, sir. Any other, any other questions? I believe... Uh, Ms. Hoffman, you One had. potential way, because Mr. Dunaway and I aren't in agreement on some of the issues on appeal, but when it comes to the record, I do agree with them to that point. You know, that was of record. The comments I made on the ex parte, it's actually part of the video play. Perhaps you should entertain something to adopt that into these proceedings. So, because you made the comment um, that your recollection about what was actually stated, it's actually there. So if you incorporate that in there and you confirm that it's, it's not affecting the, your decisions. You've at least preserved that in the record. That, that would be one alternative. Oh, before you go, Ms. Hoffman, help me. I just want to feel better about this. Are you alleging that are we tainted now by this ex parte communication? Are you saying I, that's what I essentially drew from your comments? earlier in other words are you saying the board is tainted and is not is disqualified from hearing this no the board tainted is not a very clear way to to to, to address it i think the way it, it, the most appropriate way is the same way mr jones said during the september 15th hearing which is this is quasi-judicial if it goes to the next level which means something gets filed in circuit court and you have a record then a party who won or lost could argue 
that this board was somehow influenced. There's some type of presumption of undue uh, influence. Correct. Pre basically, they were prejudiced. Um, that's the very reason why, on multiple points, your counsel, as well as Mr. Jones, said you should not engage in the dialogue. Well, and I, mean, I can recap what some of those points were, but I don't know if it's really helpful to address that before uh, Ms. Johnson goes with her arguments. Well, I guess I, I just would like to know, is that your uh, assumption, your feeling, your belief that we are now in some, uh, not able to hear this proceeding? If the motion- I mean, it is one or the other, Ms. Hoffman. Either you believe that we're not, uh, that we've been so, uh, I'll use the word tainted, that we're unable to make a full and fair hearing after giving all the parties a chance to present their evidence, it, or we aren't. It's one of the two. Uh, it's one of the two with the divider in between it. Let me explain it. On a motion to dismiss, whether or not there's evidence or not isn't considered. It's just a pleading. This board is not prejudiced by making a legal determination on a motion to dismiss. However, if you go forward and consider evidence, then I think for purposes of the record, you need to revisit what was addressed at the September 15th hearing. At a bare minimum, listen to the 15 minutes then make the disclosure the same way it's addressed at the beginning when the question about any ex parte communication. If you're gonna not deal with this case as to a motion to dismiss, I think you need to clarify the ex parte communication and just put it on the record. There are options to deal with it, but it starts with the, the board addressing what actually was stated and, and clarifying their own position. Because at the beginning, when you start the meetings, the they ask, has anyone had ex parte communication? Well, that would be incumbent on the board to address those points. But as far as is this board tainted to make a ruling on a motion to dismiss? No. And the reason why is because it doesn't matter ultimately what any evidence is on, uh, on, on a motion to dismiss. It's a question of does the party who filed it even have standing? Only a party that has standing can actually present evidence. If you're making that determination, it doesn't make any difference how you were inclined to think on the evidence. You may be in favor, you may be against, but if you're looking at it and said, hey, this party doesn't have standing, and that's our determination, I don't think there's any ex parte communication that's occurred, at least at the September 15th hearing, that would taint the board from making that ruling. Thank you, sir. Okay, I believe... Uh, Mr. Chairman, just... Real oh, briefly. I'm sorry, sir. I, I would feel, I, I'm just trying to think about writing this appeal, and I would just feel more comfortable, just, just tell us, I mean, or can you fully and faithfully carry out and make a decision in this board on these issues today? I believe the answer will be yes and will be done, and therefore we won't have a mystery for the appellate record, we'll know for certain. So Mr. Hoffman has said, it, you know, and I thought Mr. Godwin said it very <coughs> clearly. It either is or it isn't. Either you're tainted or you're not tainted, and I don't believe you are, so simply tell us and then let's move on. Thank you. You want to make some type of motion or just, we're way off track here. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, essentially, I think that Mr. Hoffman has called the legitimacy of the hearing in question. And therefore, I'm not sure what you do about that. I've never, this is whole new. If I may suggest, you may simply, and arguably, the discussion that occurred, the comments came from the applicant on the second case. So one could argue that if there was in fact any ex parte communication that occurred at the last hearing, then the disclosure would need to occur before the second case is heard. Right now you're addressing the first case. If, if however, you wish to make a disclosure now on the record, you can certainly do so. And state 
that yes, there were comments received from one of the applicants at the last meeting and make your disclosure. And what will we disclose? That there were comments made at the last meeting from the applicant. I believe the board did, uh, you made some comments um, and, and that's all that needs to happen. And if, if one of the attorneys who's representing a party would like to question you about that discussion, then they may do so. And that would remove any presumption of prejudice. Would it be prudent to hear the minutes or the, the discussion from last meeting so that all parties and the general public hears the same thing we heard? I don't, there, there is not a transcript. That meeting is recorded. The video is available. Um, you may, as Mr. Hoffman suggested, adopt that portion of the record as part of this meeting in order to clarify the record for this meeting. And Mr. Chairman, I suggest that um, we table uh, any uh, motion and, and uh, take it up when we hear case number two. You'd like to I, move forward without address, foot, finishing yeah. of this part. Of course, number two, comments were made in, in both. Yeah. And the farther we go down the line, if you adopt Mr. Hoffman's uh, reasoning, then the more our proceeding becomes uh, illegitimate. I mean, that's kind of what we've been. We, this board has been accused of is not being a, uh, uh, not uh, being able to hold a fair hearing. So under the resolution 96-13, which applies to this board, the subject of the communication, the identity of the person, group, or entity with whom the communication took place must be disclosed and made a part of the record before final action on the matter. That's what you may do if there is some concern here, and then you can move on. So, so we need to make a motion indicating? No, you do not necessarily need to make a motion. You don't need to take final action on it, but you may enter that into the record, your comments, your disclosure. Do we you disclose as an individual or as a You board? may, yes, you were all present, yes. Okay. Well, I'll start it out then. Um, okay. Uh, board, um, there was some ex parte communication uh, with the applicant um, on uh, September 15th. And do you, I suppose, do you believe that that would have any undue influence on your ability to hear this matter today? I don't believe that um, it influences uh, any decision I might make, uh, but I would. Um, I may want to review um, the, uh, the, the video, uh, as my recollection may not be the best. I recall that I was uh, attempting to ask uh, the order of how we would hear the cases, and I was uh, I was cut off. That's the easiest way to say it. Uh, I do remember Ms. Hofstetter making her comments. None of those uh, actions uh, would in any way influence my opinion uh, until I've heard uh, the uh, evidence that's presented to us in order that I can make a full and fair hearing uh, I understand 
being a lawyer that it is especially important that all sides get due process. Uh, so I'm not uh, in any way prejudiced by uh, her remarks or, and mine was a simple question that was <clears throat> begun but never answered. So I can only give it my best judgment, Mr. Chairman, my best fair judgment. Uh, this is Chair Albie Smith. Any comments made by uh, Ms. Hostetter at the uh, September 15 meeting, which uh, involved uh, matters under consideration by the board, uh, has affected me in no way. I would concur with Mr. Smith. Um, she did appear at the um, September 15th meeting. Uh, I recall that she, the reason for her discussion was to request, um, I believe, members of staff to be present at this meeting for her to cross examine. Um, and it in no way influences my decisions made today. Is that okay, Councilor? Mr. Chairman, I also would move that we uh, adopt the relevant portions of the transcript, uh, the video transcript that's on file, and make it a part of the official record of this case. A second. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Those in favor signify raise your right hand. Passes unanimously, so done. Mr. Chairman, it's approaching 10 o'clock or so. Uh, you think we might take? 10 minute break. Yeah.
Okay, Board of Adjustment Committee is now back in session. We, uh, uh, the administrative body of the Escambia County Development Review Committee moves to dismiss AP-2021-01 for lack of standing and in support. The, uh, who's, who's making the present? Thank oh, you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. So pending before this board, there's two motions to dismiss for lack of standing that I have filed, one in each of the cases. We're going to address the one that has to do with Emerald Coast Keepers first. So in terms of standing, the applicant has the burden of proving an adverse impact. Specifically, the applicant should show two things. First, that the applicant's property will suffer an adverse impact as a result of the issuance of the development order if the issuance is not modified. Second, the applicant must show, since it is a third party, that the adverse impact peculiar to the applicant differs in kind as opposed to degree to any adverse impact suffered by the community as a whole. So in other words, the applicant is required to show today special damages that it has suffered that differ in kind from any damages suffered by the community as a whole. Emerald Coast Keeper Inc., from, as, what I, as far as I can see from the public records, does not own any property in Escambia County. If in, Emerald Coast does not own any property in Escambia County, how could it possibly be true that their property will suffer an adverse impact as a result of this decision? Even if the applicant could meet the first hurdle of establishing that its property would suffer an adverse impact, the applicant must still show that the adverse impact differs in kind from any suffered by the community as a whole. So the applicant must prove that it has a definite interest exceeding the general interest shared by all citizens of the county. Essentially, a finding that the Emerald Coast Keepers has standing to challenge the issuance of this development order would be a finding that they have standing to challenge any development order ever issued by the DRC. That is not the intent of the strict standard that is outlined in the Florida Supreme Court case of Renard versus Dade County. To quote the holding in that case, they held, we therefore align ourselves with the authorities which hold that one seeking redress either preventive or corrective against an alleged violation of a municipal zoning ordinance must allege and prove special damages peculiar to himself differing in kind as distinguished from damages differing in degree suffered by the community as a whole. This strict standard of standing is distinguishable from the liberal standard of standing that applies in a case to challenge a development order's consistency with a comprehensive plan. That would be an action under Florida Statute 163.3215, which establishes a much more liberal standard for standing. Under that statute, standing is established upon a showing of an adverse interest protected or furthered by the comprehensive plan that exceeds in degree, so that's different from the differing in kind standard that applies here today. So if it, was, if it was an action challenging the consistency of the development order with the comprehensive plan, the standard would be that the interest exceeds in degree the general interest in community good shared by all persons. That is not the standard that is applicable today. And I just want the board to understand that the standard for today is much more strict. Uh, the comprehensive plan is not being considered by the board today consistency with the comprehensive plan that would be a totally separate action and for those reasons and for the reasons set forth in my motion i request that this action be dismissed for lack of standing board members any any question of staff ms jones i see mr donaway Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Mr. Chairman, if I might ask for a point of clarification, are we, apologize. My understanding, because I haven't been following this separate appeal, and again, to be clear, I represent Emerald Coastkeeper, 
Um, I do not represent Ms. Hostetter. So I just want to be clear, this is a motion as to dismissal as to Emerald Coast Keeper, and you have already disposed of the applicant's motion to dismiss as to Emerald Coast Keeper. So we're only focused on the county's motion. That's what I just want to make clear. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Mr. Chairman, uh, with that information, then I would uh, request permission to call Ms. Lori Murphy, who uh, is the representative, my client representative, to ask her questions to lay the groundwork for the, um, her standing. Ms. Lori Murphy. Mr. Chairman, if it would please uh, the board, if I could ask the questions from council table while Ms. Murphy is at podium. The board has no objection. Thank you. And if you're not an attorney, would you be sworn, please? Raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony about to be in this case be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Please state and spell your first and last name. Laurie, that's L A U R I E. Last name is Murphy, M U R P H Y. Ms. Murphy, please state for the record um, your position with Emerald Coast Keeper. Yes, I'm the executive director of Emerald Coast Keeper. And Ms. Um, Murphy, as the executive director of Emerald Coast Keeper, please tell the board the purpose uh, and, and mission of Emerald Coast Keeper. Yes, Emerald Coast Keeper has been around since about 1999. Uh, I was appointed by Bobby Kennedy Jr. to have an area of the panhandle of Florida to look out for environmental problems, especially things like human health indicators uh, and other types of issues that may arise that could uh, generate problems based on the plans of that uh, municipal government. And Ms. Murphy, how have you and Emerald Coast Keeper exercised that mission in the last uh, several years? Well, about 11, 12 years ago, Emerald Coast Keeper became very uh, involved in uh, putting together some brand new tree ordinances for the city of Pensacola. Uh, and the Levin firm donated that time for us to do that, and we were able to reduce the diameter breast height of the tree, understanding the carbon sinks that trees offer, uh, and how that would impact climate change in the future. And uh, lately, in the last couple of years, I have put together, being a past member of the City of Pensacola Planning Board, a way to help uh, increase even some more protections for the environment and the trees itself and the future of climate change based on the comprehensive plan and based on the local ordinances that were in place. And Ms. Murphy, are you familiar, or in what way are you familiar with the comprehensive plan of Escambia County as it concerns uh, protection of trees? Yes, uh, the comprehensive plan, which is now uh, going to be through 2030, I believe, uh, designates some specific protections for trees and vegetation. Uh, that looking at a mindful development and understanding that certain trees have more protections than others. Escambia County has one of the most liberal uh, diameter breast height protections in the country. Most of them range 36 inches or below diameter breast height, and that is because we, uh, we have learned that over the years that uh, we're reducing the diversity of trees in our environment by cutting select fuse like pine trees, for example, or a lot of our older trees to add more and more urban development. In this case, we are removing some of the most biggest protective mechanisms that we have in place in our comprehensive plan that will allow us to, to make good decisions uh, when it comes to development. Not, not developing, there's nothing wrong with developing, but good mindful decisions and how we can maintain the integrity and diversity of vegetation uh, for future generations. Mr. Dunaway, I'm sorry to interrupt you, sir, but at this point, we, we are not addressing the appeal per se. We, we have to get standing first. Right. Yes, sir. And I'm Thank sure you. you're leading to that. But yes, I sir. Just Thank you. To make sure. Thank you. Ms. Murphy, as the, uh, as the chairman has correctly pointed out, the issue that is before the board now is the issue of standing. 
And you heard um, Ms. Johnson indicate that there, um, the, this board and the law does not want just anybody to be able to show up and to make an application for an appeal because that would be, that, that would be far afield. But in this case, uh, the law allows that those who exceed in degree an interest in the matter that's being brought are able to bring forward a case. How is it that Coast Keepers meets that level of standing? Mr. Uh, Chairman, that is the improper standard that he just stated. The standard is that it differs in kind as opposed to degree. That's true. There are two different standards. There is one standard that applies in a proceeding under 163.3215, and that would apply to an action challenging the consistency of a development order with a comprehensive plan. In this case, the standard that applies is what's called the Renard Special Damages Rule, and that's what's articulated in the Land Development Code. There are two different standards, and one is far more liberal. This is a stricter standard. Mr. Smith, I, if I may clarify the question. With regards to my uh, uh, earlier question, the, how does it differ in kind with regards to you as an applicant as opposed to anyone else who might just show up and, and want to waste this board's time all day? Yes, uh, it is differing kind uh, due to the active work that the organization does uh, to protect uh, trees and vegetation and if this uh, if that's not a, a standing then nobody will ever have a way to help look at options and ways for mindful development based on not just the comprehensive plan but what is happening with the EPA because I actually um, certify stormwater inspectors and the EPA says that post-development needs to equal pre-development. And if you can't do that, you're gonna remove a tree and put down thousands of square feet of impervious pavement. There is no way they can compensate for that. That is what's going to create a problem for my organization that spends oodles of time with the city of Pensacola and with the county on the developing the tree ordinances. And we've not been able to move forward with the tree ordinance with the county which has created a problem because if we were able to do that based on the comments from the public, then we wouldn't be sitting here today. And Ms. Murphy, are you familiar, or how are you familiar with the um, Escambia County Land Development Code, and more particular, the design management standards with regards to protected trees? Uh, yes, because I have some copies here of the current standards, and it does talk about um, not only just federally or state required, but there's some director's recommendations in here in the design standards manual that are very important that need to be looked at here because they actually bring about uh, talking about how we are going to address uh, this uh, stormwater runoff, for example. How are we going to address uh, any of these uh, particular problems with heritage trees? right here, heritage trees. A protected tree 60 inches or greater in Mr. diameter. Mr. Chairman, I believe that these arguments are to the merits and not necessarily to standing. Mr. Chairman, I'll tender the witness to the yes. um, county for cross-examination, thank you. Yes, sir. Just one question on cross. I believe that you stated that the county's tree ordinance standards are liberal in nature. Is that true? That is my opinion. It's not a fact. Yes. Do you believe that this is the proper forum to suggest or to recommend changes to the ordinance? I believe that uh, public participation is very important in de the development of ordinances and the comprehensive plan in any design standards manuals because the more minds you have together, the better the outcome and the decisions are made uh, when, when you keep them very basic and you have just this board, even everybody in this room would not be enough people to make that decision or change. 
honestly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Those are my only questions, but I do have argument and response. Do you have anything else, Mr. Don? I have no further questions for okay. the witness, Mr. Chairman. So you wanted to summarize? Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. The county, well, the DRC does not dispute that the Emerald Coast Keepers, their mission is to address and to resolve environmental issues in the local era, area. However, that goes to degree. The standard in this matter is whether their interest differs in kind as distinguished from damages differing in degree. The DRC also does not dispute that the county street ordinance is very liberal in nature. However, this is not the forum to argue or to even get into what the ordinance should say and why, why it is worded the way that it is worded. Their interest, and I'm, I'm referring to Emerald Coast Keepers, it is the same kind of interest of everyone that is sitting in this room today. Everyone cares about trees and the, the large trees specifically. However, that interest does not differ in kind, and that is the standard, and I would ask that this proceeding be dismissed. The, the Emerald Coast Keepers did not address whether they own any property in Escambia County either. I'd like to remind the board that the standard is that they show that their property will suffer an adverse impact as a result of this development order, and that's not possible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, I, I, I do want to point out um, for the record with regards to um, the case that the uh, Learning Council uh, quoted with regards to the uh, standard that we're dealing with today uh, being the uh, Renard case. I want to make, uh, make sure that we're clear that we're talking about the same, the right case. Uh, Renard v. Dade County, that's 261 Southern 2nd, 832. That's a Florida case from 1972. And it is, uh, it is uh, accurate that it requires a showing of special damages differing in kind as distinguishes, as distinguished from differing in damages in degree suffered by the community at whole. I want to point out, Your Honor, and uh, Counsel Ms. Johnson stated it clearly, that that applies to issues of zoning ordinances. Before you today is a design standard manual application. This has nothing to do with zoning. It's not a rezoning. It's not a rezoning hearing, a rezoning appeal, a rezoning. It's not a, um, a variance to zoning. It's not an issue of setbacks. It's not an issue of any of those. It's an application of a design ma standard, uh, design manual standard. That therefore the Renard case does not apply with regards to that. Now, I believe that your uh, focus will be your own uh, procedures in your land development code. And I'd like to invite your attention as we review some of those. Section 1-1.11 is the rules for understanding the land development uh, provisions. General, the land development code shall be interpreted and administered broadly by the administrative authorities described in this chapter to achieve its declared purposes. They shall be, these are, this is the standards, shall be understood to be minimum requirements adopted by the Board of County Commissioners for the promotion of the health, public health, safety, and general welfare. It is presumed that the intent of the BCC in a particular provision of the code is expressed by the wording of that provision. And the meaning, the confirmation of meaning provided by the Land Development Code must first be evaluated according to the plain language of the provision and interpreted so as to be in, in, internally consistent. So Mr. Chairman, gets, let's get to the point of an appeal of an LDC-based determination. That comes from section 1-1.12, the next section. The section directly following how you should interpret the Land Development Code. Persons whose substantial interest have been adversely affected by an interpretation or other administrative decisions, and let's be clear that this is a administrative decision of the body, the governing body, the Development Review Committee, that is before you. They looked at the Land Development Code as you are directed to look at the Land Development Code. 
They looked at the facts that were presented to them as you are here in your quasi-judicial uh, uh, position to look at it, to evaluate. And that is, they made a decision. It is that decision, not whether it was good or bad, whether that decision was uh, correct in the Land Development Code. Review of any such action, the action of the DRC, may be requested following the applicable appeal action as prescribed in Chapter 2. So the decision was made. There is a procedure which we are directed to look to in Chapter 2 to find out how that gets to you. So let's look at that Chapter 2. And in that, uh, in that provision we find that within 15 days, one, an applicant can file and bring that to this board. Bring that to this board. What are we bringing to you? Not whether it is a good thing to save trees or not save trees, or whether it is a good thing to build storage units or not build storage units. Not that. The decision it's the focus of the decision, whether they applied the code correctly. That is what is here. Ms. Murphy told you very clearly why she and her organization filed the timely application for the appeal. Because her organization and she personally for over 10 years have been actively involved in Tree, the tree ordinance, both advocating on its behalf, looking to strengthen it, and making sure that it is followed. Why are there not a lot of appeals? Because it's normally the application of the, uh, um, the LDC is correct. So as Ms. Murphy said, if, in this case, if we were to take um, Madam Council's argument correctly, if we were to issue of a design standard for the protection of a tree, and again, we're not talking about anything else. We're talking, well, this is what we're here for. So the standing issue is determined on the issue that is here before you, not on other things. It's not a zoning issue. It's not a, um, uh, a conditional use. It's not an appeal of variance. It's the application of whether the tree ordinance, the, the protection, in fact, specifically whether um, design standard 2-5.1, the removal criteria, has been correctly applied. In that case, no one except, based on Madam Council's argument, except an adjacent property owner could ever bring to your attention and, importantly, to the public's attention, a concern, again, it may be that they have applied it correctly. That's what the board is here to determine. But a concern that potentially the Development Review Committee, in this case, did not get it correct. And if you find that that's the case, then that will, be, uh, uh, that will be an action. If you find that it is, that they did get it correct, then there, as I mentioned earlier, other options. Again, the issue is who, who in Escambia County could bring a case before you to highlight a potential concern that the removal criteria for the tree protection ordinance has not been properly administered. If not the Emerald Coast Keeper, then as Ms. Murphy said, and I agree, that there is no one in Escambia County who could do that. Now, the Land Development Code, as I've said, indicates that you should interpret its provisions broadly, that you should interpret them to be internally consistent. That is, 
that if there is a issue that is of concern to an applicant, then that applicant ought to be heard at this board. Such is the case here today. An applicant, Emerald Coast Keeper, has a concern that the Development Review Committee did not properly apply the provisions of 2-5.1, the removal of the tree for the building of an enormous, enormously large storage unit. That is the issue. That is their appeal. They are uniquely, in fact, uniquely qualified. They do have a differing in kind issue, even if we were to apply the Renard standard, which I submit to you is not the standard in the sense of it having to be that technical and there being this huge distinction between the standing issues. Because, if I may, on Friday of last week, Madam Council and I had a conversation because the first judicial circuit changed the rule on standing last week in, the state, in Florida in the first DCA as it concerns the issue of standing under 163.32.15. Now, as Madam Counsel, your counsel has indicated, that is not the standard that we are asking you to apply here because that is not the standard that applies here. So let me be clear about that. However, as I said in the very early arguments of early on in this hearing, there are two ways that we leave here today. <coughs> I mean, there are two appeal ways that we leave here today. And that is important because one of them is a writ of cert. That writ of cert will absolutely have to follow the criteria that Madam Counsel is talking about and, and arguing. Okay, that is the differing in kind standard, without a doubt. The second option is a inconsistency determination under 163.32.15. That will be the standard of the exceeds uh, in degree, the more liberal. In fact, I believe, and Madam Council can answer on behalf, but I believe the county has conceded that Emerald Coast Keeper meets that standard. So coming out of here will be an appeal one way or the other, potentially. And just to be clear, there can be appeals in both directions, meaning there can be both a writ of cert and a petition for inconsistent, a, a suit for in, a complaint for inconsistency under 3215. However, you, as you know, your citizens, your business owners, your, your, these things cost money. They're extraordinarily expensive to bring this kind of litigation. This entity, my client, is asking you to fix it right here, to, to consider it. It may be that they did it correctly. That'd be great, at least we'll know. The public will have the opportunity, they'll hear your arguments, we'll know. Maybe they did, but maybe they didn't. And if they didn't, it'd be helpful to know now. Instead of having to spend thousands of dollars to take up on appeal on an issue of whether Mr. Dunaway got his S's right, which we've already determined I did not, and we're still here, or whether we're differing in degree, differing in kind, or some other standard that I believe is applicable from the Land Development Code that you have. A liberal interpretation of the code to address or to redress potential wrongs. Ms. Murphy, through Emerald Coast Keeper, has brought to your attention the, uh, the potential, the idea, uh, the concern that they got it wrong. Please address it. Hear the evidence. Make a ruling. We believe that standing is consistent. We believe that Emerald Coast Keeper ought to be allowed to proceed, and we would ask that you so decide. Thank you. Uh, board, I just wanted to reiterate and direct you to section 2-6.10 of the Land Development Code, 
the standard that was articulated in the Renard case has been incorporated into that section of the Land Development Code. That is the standard that applies. Under that provision, those persons who are third parties to the administrative decision and who suffer an adverse impact that differs in kind as opposed to degree to any adverse impact suffered by the community as a whole would have standing. May, may I address? Yes, sir. The code provisions that I think are important to look at, because you've listened to a lot of argument, but the relevant provisions that form the county's motion to dismiss are pretty straightforward. If you go to 2-610, number one, it says the applicant has the burden of proof. Then, under subsection three, it has one provision that pretty much explains it. Number one, although the hearing before the board is open to the public, only those persons or entity withstanding will be allowed to present testimony or other evidence during the hearing. That includes the applicant for example, if my client had been denied the development order, they would automatically be able to come to you and argue, put forth evidence. The other one, though, is one sentence, and it states, those persons who are third parties to the administrative decision and who suffer an adverse impact that differs in kind as opposed to degree to any adverse impact suffered by the community as a whole. That's really the kicker of what we're dealing with right now. And when... Uh, Mr. Dunaway put forth his client to testify on that. I want to be clear what the testimony was. It went through and addressed all the efforts that Emerald Coast Keepers had done with respect to the tree ordinance. But it never addressed being an actual property owner. And when it explained the nature of the damage, it was their concern over climate issues. Well, climate issues are the same thing that affect every single person in this room. We all suffer that. Now, the difference is someone can say, our organization cares about that more than you. And there are a lot of organizations like that out there, a lot of grassroots organizations in environmental areas and other ones that push forward agenda items that they do care about more than other people in the general public. But the damage that would be suffered is the same. Now, the question is, do you have to be a property owner? In fact, no, you don't. There are arguably situations where that wouldn't have to occur. For example, you had an appeal last year where there's someone who was addressing whether the access to the Monarch subdivision, whether that would infect them. You could have someone who you know, could make some argument, even if they're not a property owner, about how the, the removal of that specific tree affects them. The argument that's been given to explain standing in this case, though, is much more general. Generally, because this entity is pushing items forth that deal with tree protection and environmental that they have a basis to establish standing. If you read that provision, you don't. And in fact, Ms. Johnson asked the question, very relevant, do you think if there's ambiguity or this code provision should be changed, that this is the place to do it? And, she, and, and, and the witness gave a little bit of a shaky answer, but basically I interpret it to be that public participation is important and it kind of starts here. Well, in fact, it doesn't start here. Not if you read this code provision, it doesn't start here at all. That's with the county commissioners. And I go so far to say as if it did start here, we may not get any volunteers who want to be on the board of adjustment. If every single time any organization who's got a concern that the damage would be the exact same suffered by everybody else in the community, but they had an opportunity to come and essentially put the county on trial and how they make decisions every single time, it absolutely makes the process tremendously more burdensome. There's an old adage, bad facts make bad law. And I would argue that this case fits that billet. What that means is, at times, there is a case that comes before a judge or a quasi-judicial board like you, where you think, you know what, I'm actually buying the argument. The factual arguments compel me. Perhaps you care about trees, perhaps you don't, but let's just assume for a minute you do. The problem is, to make a ruling and adopt those facts, you have to disregard the law. You have to disregard what that, what that code provision is. In the preamble that Mr. Dunaway read to you at the beginning, it did not say, replace your common sense ruling of what that means, which is very clear in kind versus degree. As a board, you are tasked to carry out what that, what that wording says. Now, 
the end result of these, this process may one day result in a more liberalized position on standing. But that would belong to the county commission, not you. You don't have that authority. It's not your job. And if anyone approaches anyone on this board and said, you didn't care about trees if you granted the motion to dismiss, that wouldn't at all be accurate. You're applying the rule of law, the code that's written. And that doesn't mean you're always in agreement with it. Right now, the position the county has put forth explains that standing has not been established. And after Mr. Dunaway elicited the testimony from his client, it's even more clear because the in-kind reference they're referring to is the same damage that every single one of us suffers. That's what the differentiating factor is on how this provision is written. And if this board allows that, precedent's been set. Every time a development order gets entered, any single group who cares about an issue, regardless if they have an adjoining property or can explain how they suffer an in-kind difference in damage, they could come to this board and, or, and, and basically demand the opportunity to put forth evidence, essentially put the county on trial, put the staff on trial. That's why that provision's written the way it's written. For that reason, this motion to dismiss should be adopted. It should be granted because standing has not been established. I will say at the beginning, the motion to dismiss did not actually clarify. It, it, it relied on the absence of the appeal addressing standing as the basis. And admittedly, Emerald Coast Keepers' appeal did not address how it had standing. Now that they've put forth a witness, they have confirmed that the basis for standing is the same damage suffered by any other person in the public. Nothing unique or specific to them. That's the differentiating factor. That's the reason why this motion to dismiss should be granted, not only for this case, but for the importance of establishing precedence and how this board handles matters going forward. Ms. Johnson accurately cited all the provisions in prior cases from last year when these appeals were made, every single one of them, the party had standing. They were able to show they were an adjoining property owner or in the case of the Monarch subdivision, how you're putting in something that affects how you get to your home I mean, or, or where you're living. That's different than what we're dealing with here. And the one other part that, that's important when I talk about the more liberalized standard, if a development order is being challenged because it's inconsistent with the comprehensive plan, the degree of standing on that is more liberal. That is not this case. And to be blunt, if it was, jurisdiction for that would be in circuit court. The Land Development Code accurately states that. Ms. Johnson and the county laid forth what the applicable Supreme Court standard is under the Renard case about what the limitations are on this board. And while Mr. Dunaway disputes that applies, the, the property owner's position is the same as the county. That position applies. Even if you say, I don't know today which one applies, it's already incorporated in the Land Development Code. The Renard standard, the standard that's more specific, that references that it must be in kind as opposed to agree, that's already in the Land Development Code. So for those reasons, we support the county's position on the motion to dismiss and request this board um, make a determination that it's dismissed only on the basis of standing. Thank you, sir. I am. I would like. Case. He is not the app, the uh, county. He spoke and with his opinion on the d county's uh, motion to dismiss. Chair, so I would like to speak as well. Chair does not recognize you at this time. Why did you recognize this gentleman who is not the county representative? This is a motion He's by the county to of dismiss. The intervening party to this case. Because. He is an intervening party, but I believe that this is not, uh, you know, I would like to speak You're about not recognized. the matter of the third party versus the applicant. Board members, any questions? I'd like to hear our, our attorney again with his, uh, her advice on the Renard case. 
the standard that was articulated in the Renard case, the special damages rule, was incorporated into Section 2-6.10 of the Land Development Code, and that is the standard that applies. Does it apply to the design yes. manual? Yes. The Section 2-6.10 De sets forth all the requirements for the appeal of an administrative decision. In that section, there is a subsection that specifies who has legal standing, and the standard that is set forth there that applies to a third party other than the applicant is the Renard standard. They must have an interest that differs in kind as opposed to degree. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Mr. Chairman, I have a question. Um, we've heard Mr. Dunleavy um, speak of um, standing. Um, we had asked that um, he give us evidence of standing. I didn't hear anything um, that suggested that uh, the third party has standing. But I would, I would like Ms. Hostetter to um, answer that question on behalf of the organization itself. Wait a minute. She's not She's in this. She's not That's in this. That's the next case. That's a different case. But it's That's the next. same point in my dismissal motion to dismiss that you will be But we're not on that okay. case yet. <laughs> I take It's the same issue, sir. We have a motion dismissed for the same reason on my case as well. I would like to hear from Mr. Dunaway as to what's on the screen right now. It talks about the applicant has the burden of presenting competent substantial evidence to the board that establishes each of the following conditions with regard to the decision being appealed. Could you address those five items? So just, just to clarify, sub three sets forth the standing. Then this is sub four, and that same standard is what you'll see as E. And also, Mr. Dunaway, if I could piggyback off of my colleague's request, could you explain uh, the factors that are set out that are before us are are they evident are they decidable they should be decided upon evidence that's available in the case rather than in a motion i, I heard your question and let me get to it just a bit. so if i could If I could have to address, I'm sorry, to address Ms. Bass's question, uh, Mr. Chairman, and Mr. Godwin, could I ask staff, whoever is controlling whatever this board is, would you bring up Land Development Code Section 2-6.3, I mean point ten, so we can see what we're... Yeah, no, this, this is a section. Mm -hmm. it, this is the one I was, I was referring to. Thank you. So go back to, so we can see the heading for, that is sub three. Okay, so 
appeal of administrative decisions, right, now standing. So, although open to the public, we've got that, only those persons with standing will be allowed to present, and so that includes the applicant. Now, a question is, is that, is that referring to the person who filed the appeal, or is that referring to the property owner? Hold that ball or other person who received the adverse decision from the county. So the other person who received the adverse decision, in this case, the, the, the property owner did not receive an adverse decision. Theirs, it was a, their, their project was approved. So the person who received it, that's Emerald Coast Keeper. Those persons who are the parties to administrative decision. Okay, so in the in-kind decision. So that's the point that I was making. That's, we're on the same point there. So, Ms. Bass, with regards to your question, please address the issue of standing or the issue that was on the board earlier of our burden. Because we recognize we have the burden if we were to proceed. I guess it, I guess I assume that they were all considered together. I believe it's proper to to separate that we're d discussing at this point the issue of standing. Okay. I apologize. Um, that we're this is the issue of standing, and then in this case, this is the the issue that is before us. Does Emerald Coast Keeper? And again, I want to. I want to be clear, both for the record and for the board, especially uh, uh, Mr. Shark. Ms. Hostelder's case is a different case, same application, but it, it, it's unusual to be sure that there are two appeals of the same action. But I represent, Ms. Lori, please stand up. Uh, I represent Ms. Lori Murphy and Emerald Coast Keeper. So that's, that's my client. So, and the, we clarified on this, this is the issue for lack of standing for Emerald Coast Keeper. You heard from Ms. Murphy with regards to our organization. We believe whether you are looking at, uh, whether you're looking at these standards for who can be before you to present the issue of whether the DRC made the correct decision that Emerald Coast Keeper is absolutely someone with standing because they absolutely have a differing in kind interest in this issue. And the issue of the slippery slope that Mr. Hoffman, and it's a good argument, I, I don't fault him for it, but the, the, the solution to that is you simply say no to those organizations. I mean, if, if every Tom, Dick, and Harry gets up, you simply say, I'm sorry, you don't have standing. But when Emerald Coast Keeper gets up, to talk about the protection of trees, not just any tree, protected trees under the code, and in this case, an 85 inch heritage oak, then they have a differing in kind interest. Thank you. Also, Mr. Dunaway. Yes. Isn't a lot, uh, or basically what we're discussing it, aren't these questions of fact? Mm -mm. Well, for example, the for the uh, uh, the previous requirements that were shown on the screen for what a uh, applicant has to the burden that they have to carry. Oh, for, certainly, without uh, without a doubt, Mr. Godwin, that they're will be facts at issue with regards to uh, the burden. Let's, for instance, again. Well, how does that fit into a motion to dismiss? Do you assume in the motion to dismiss that all facts stated by a party are correct? Or how would you, in other words, <laughs> we have a motion before us to dismiss. Then uh, are we to assume that all the allegations in it are correct? that you uh, don't meet the uh, burden. Do you, do you understand what I'm asking? I, I do think I understand. And, and Mr. Godwin, I wouldn't presume 
to provide legal advice to the board, that, that would be Madam um, Council's, uh, Ms. Hall's uh, prerogative. But to answer from an advocate standpoint, an advocate who's arguing on behalf of the desire and we believe the legal right to be before you today to be able to present matters um, of fact to carry a burden as to whether the DRC made a correct decision or not, we would certainly argue that we do. And we do have that standing because of the facts that we presented through Ms. Murphy telling you about Emerald Coast Keeper, indicating to you their differing in uh, kind interest in this issue and the fact that as you under, as I pointed out through argument, the fact that you are to adjudicate these issues with a broad, broad interpretation of the Land Development Code to effect its uh, purposes. And in this case, its purpose is to protect, uh, to, to prevent the removal of protected trees, except under certain limited circumstances. And that's the case. And that's what we'd like to be able to present to you. So whether we have a differing in kind right to do that, that we do believe that's a, uh, that is a factual issue. We laid the factual premise for that with regards to Emerald Coast Keeper. And again, I would assert that if not Emerald Coast Keeper, then no one, no one has that uh, option. And again, I would also note that it is not a zoning issue. This is a design standard issue. Thank you. Staff, can you scroll down so I can see what number four, it, how it's, yes. thank you. Mr. Chairman, is a motion uh, in order at this time? Uh, I believe uh, Ms. Rixby has a question on the floor. Did you get your answer? Yeah, I just wanted to review number four in the actual LDC. The way it, the way I'm reading it is that if you have standing, then you'll go to the compliance review and proceed. My concern, which Michael had uh, had stated, and I was concerned with, is if in fact you do have standing, do you in fact have the compliance review? You know, are they, do they go hand in hand, which I was concerned about. That was, Mr. Chairman, that also was my concern. Uh, as you move from three into four, uh, I mean, have we heard evidence that it was arbitrary and capricious, for example? We've heard a great deal of, I think, uh, argument and evidence to some extent on the standard that uh, for uh, E, about the impact question. But I don't know if we can get there uh, at this point, and that was just, that was what I was thinking of. Maybe we need to hear from Ms. Johnson as to her motion to dis dismiss for lack of standing, and I guess that's, that's where I'm a little confused because you do bring it up at that time in your motion as far as the uh, compliance review, you talk about the uh, applicant's uh, burden. Um, and then on item B of your motion, you talk about the standing requirements. If you could explain that a little bit. 
Yes. So in my opinion, the adverse impact that is referred to in, let's see, 2-6.10B4 subsection C is the same adverse impact that is referenced in E of that section as well as the standing section of the code. In my opinion, the adverse impact that we're talking about, there has to be one that affects the applicant's property and it has to also differ in kind as opposed to degree from any adverse impact suffered by the community as a whole. And Ms. Johnson, uh, how did you arrive at that particular conclusion? What evidence did you see that gave you that uh, uh, opinion? Well, it was a lack of evidence presented in the petition that was filed by Emerald Coast Keepers. There but, was. I'm go sorry. Go go ahead. Excuse me. I'm I'm very bad about interrupting you. There uh, was no mention of any property that would be impacted. Uh, I mean, that would have given us information on standing. I disagree with his position that if not Emerald Coast Keepers to file this action, then no one can file it. A neighbor next door to this property could fi file an appeal. Someone across the street from this property could have concern about the removal of the tree because it would impact their stormwater runoff. But to say that Emerald Coast Keepers has standing would say that they have standing to challenge any development order in Escambia County. Uh, but that, and that was based, if I understood you, on a lack of evidence in their uh, Coast Keepers pleadings, is that right? Yes, sir. A lack of evidence that their adverse impact differs in kind from anyone in Escambia County. It's the same adverse impact that's suffered by any, anyone in this room. It goes to degree, their level of interest, but it is not different in kind from anyone in this room. Oh. Any other questions? Mr. Chairman, I'll only make one more thought. And these pleadings, I've always understood, need to just give general notice of what the complaint is. Seems like that's what I always understood a pleading should do. And uh, I just, uh, I'm having difficulty finding uh, evidence to support the county uh, because we haven't heard the case. We've heard an argument about various aspects of, of course, the pleadings and I will say that the argument from all three council have been excellent. I, I think they've all put on very telling points in their particular, uh, for their particular clients. But I, you know, I'm just having difficulty finding evidence to support the conclusion. Mr. The Chairman, facts. may I address that? We haven't heard the evidence yet because standing is a preliminary issue that must be handled first. The LDC provides that no one can even produce evidence if we do not establish that they have standing first to do so. That is the concern of the DRC. Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, may I address uh, Madam Council's point on that issue? <clears throat> I think. I completely agree uh, with her point, and that is we are addressing the issue of standing. I think, I think again, the issue is in the language of the Land Development Code, which I believe, as I've tried to point out, I believe that you are, are to, supposed to be the one to interpret that. 
and I believe it comes even from what uh, Ms. Johnson uh, just talked about. You ask, I, I forget who asked the question, but Ms. Johnson expounded on the issues and it, and it went to the difference between subsection 4E, the greater impact, uh, your question, that kind of looks like I have the burden that, and, and who has the burden, are we there yet? And I, we're not there yet, but look at what the code does, does say the, and the words that it uses. It says, I think if you can help me out to go down to the uh, 4E, this is the one you had called up earlier. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to get a little closer because I can't Thank read you, from sir. back there. <laughs> the greater impact. So it talks about the adverse impact <clears throat> adversely affecting the applicant. And, and again, so when we get to this section, if we're allowed to, somehow between three and four, we, we become the applicant. <laughs> it, and if you look at three, who has standing? Even Mr. Hoffman told you, the applicant. So the, am I the applicant? I, the Emerald Coast Keeper, are we the applicant? Or are we the third party? We're clearly not the third party. We're here. We filed an appeal. The, so is there, I, I don't want a tongue tie, but I understand the question and the concern. Yes, we must address the issue of standing first. We must do so before we can meet our burden as the applicant. But in three, if you go back, who has standing? The applicant. Mr. So, Chairman, I can clarify that for the board if you're willing to hear it. Thank you. So Land Development Code 2-6.10 sub B sub 3. So it categorizes who has standing to bring these, these challenges. Subsection A, the applicant or any other person who received the adverse decision from the county administrative official. The applicant referred to in that section was the applicant, the person that applied for a development order to begin with. That would have been the property owner. The person that is referred to as a third party in subsection B is someone that had nothing to do with the development order, was not a party to its issuance, and they could not have received an adverse decision from the county administrative official because they did not receive any decision. They were not applying for a development order, so they were not receiving any decision. So the applicant referred to in subsection A is the person that applied for a development order. I agree that this section then goes on to reference the applicant um, again, but that applicant is the person that applied to appeal this decision. At every level of the DRC and the review processes, there is an applicant. Um, I, I could also add that the term applicant is defined in Chapter 6 of the Land Development Code as any person, including the person's agent, who submits an application to the county requesting development approval or other consideration according to any of the compliance review processes prescribed by the LDC. So that does not include third parties, which is the reason why there's a separate section that relates to third yes, parties. Correct. Correct. So I've highlighted I, that section for you. So there are, I think, two separate applicants, if you will. There might be an applicant who is appealing an administrative decision in this case, but what's being referenced in that provision is the applicant who was seeking the development order. The per, another party would be a third party. They were not at the, at the previous stage the one seeking the development order. So there are two separate provisions in the standing section that address an applicant versus a third party. And also, Mr. Chairman, it is not this board's authority to interpret the Land Development Code. We have our planning official present. If there's a question in terms of interpretation, that is his responsibility. Sir, I am mm -hmm. sorry. I request to be heard because this is the exact 
motion to dismiss that the county has for my appeal. And because this is crucial to your decision yes. making, you're, you're I would like to give you my understanding. your case. Can you understand But it's the that? same motion, sir. It's the same motion, the same basis for the dismissal of the ap uh, applicant, Mr. Uh, Dunaway's client, Emerald Coast Keeper, as it is mine. So if you make a decision now without hearing my explanation for the uh, standing question, then you are cutting me out from having an opportunity to present my position on standing in this very matter. And you will have established precedent, and then my case will also be shut if you should rule in the county's favor that Mr. Dunaway's client should have his mo their motion dismissed for lack of standing. Chairman, Chairman, respectfully, with much respect, for the time and the interest of all of these citizens who are here and, and our time and your time respectfully, very, very much respectfully, we do respect, we do ask you to please be mindful of the constant of trying to address and not to stay in sequence of what the county attorneys has suggested, even you as the chair, please, we ask you because the constant disruptions and interruptions is not favorable for anyone. It's not doing anybody no good. So we do, honestly, even for Ms. Hausstetter, to please because these hearings, they are quasi-judicial, they are they govern by certain rules of procedures. You got an excellent attorney who's trying to help govern to keep the sanctity of these decisions, of these decisions in order and force transparency. I've been doing this a long time, and I know how these type of technicalities, and even in conjunction with Mr. Will Dunaway, we have been doing these things a long time. And we do know how challenging, difficult, and how these rules must be followed to maintain the order, order and the decorum of the rules of law. So, Butcher Chairman, we ask you to please maintain the decorum and the sanctity of this governing body today. I repeat, this is the exact same argument the county has used to dismiss my case for lack of standing. And I have an answer to it, and I request respectfully that you give me an opportunity to present my answer to this serious and crucial point of whether there is standing at, for an applicant being either Emerald Coast Keeper as the applicant or myself as an applicant in both of these cases before you make a decision that if, in the ne if you agree with the county would automatically dismiss my case. Thank you, please let me speak. Board members, uh, again, uh, Ms. Hosteller is out of order, but uh, do you think it will create any further problems if we allow her to speak? Yes, it would. I would, no. I would be very hesitant to continue with Ms. Hostetter at this point. I believe that Mr. Dunaway is very capable of making his case for his client, and I would like to stick with the parties at hand. Y'all concur with that, so let Mr. Dunaway will speak for this case, not you. I appreciate that, and I would just want to be on the record to say that when I am presented with the same arguments, I will have slightly but significantly different answers, and I do have standing. Mr. Dunaway, did you have anything? 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to make it clear for the record that I represent Emerald Coast Keeper in this case on this appeal uh, and not Ms. Hostetter. Thank you. Board members, any questions? Mr. Chairman, well, I guess I'm kind of feeling we're nearing the part of wrapping this up. Uh, I think we promised Mr. Hoffman a chance if he wanted to make any additional comments, and Mr. maybe Hoffman? this might be uh, an appropriate time. Thank you. Um, the real key that you're dealing with right now is standing. I think you've heard enough to know that it's a critically important issue. I think one statement that I do disagree from Mr. Dunaway that I think is important, he acknowledged the slippery slope argument, but then he stated, but if it comes to you again, you can just tell the person if it's not appropriate, we don't, we don't want to deal with it. Stop for a moment and think about that. I'm not for a moment doubting the validity of Emerald Coast Keeper's cause, what they believe in, but is it this board's role? Say that's an individual down the road who stands up making the same type argument. Are you very easily going to be able to dismiss that argument just because they don't arguably care as much as Emerald Coast Keepers claims it does? That's the very reason why that's not a component. Because if you do that, essentially you're letting everyone in. I'd say this case really breaks down into two pieces. You've got my client, the property owner, and the development order they wanted, that they have obtained. And it's relating to a tree that some people in the community feel strongly about. But then there's a whole other element to it on standing, that this becomes the gateway, exactly like Ms. Johnson stated for the county. Emerald Coast Keeper, or any other entity, could literally challenge every single development order. And there's been some discussion about the purpose of the Land Development Code as to the tree ordinance and how it's important to protect trees. Admittedly, that generalized statement is true. But the other point that's relevant is the Land Development Code is also the gateway for people who want to come to our community to develop property, to start businesses that help everyone in the community. They have to go through this process. If every one of those individuals had to know that after they filed it, even if they got a development order, that anyone, anyone could come in and seek to challenge their development order, that's exactly what this code provision seeks to prevent. And to the extent this county ever wants to go down a path where we do allow that, which wouldn't be good for business at all, that's not this board's purview. It, it's, that would be the Escambia County Commission to make that decision. This is not the starting point for that political debate. And it's not to weigh it. There's a lot of arguments that could be made about what policy should be, but here today, we are before a quasi-judicial board. And I think the last argument I could give it to you was the one I'd stated previously, which is remember, bad facts make bad law. You are making an interpretation based on a very simple provision about whether standing does or does not exist. And the arguments that Ms. Johnson have given are very compelling. In fact, more so than what was just in her motion. Her motion was limited to the fact that the appeal did not reference standing at all. After that, Mr. Dunaway put forth his client for the very limited issue of addressing how standing was established. She confirmed that, in fact, it is in kind. There's been no statement at all to explain to you how uh, an organization that's in furtherance of climate change or anything else to do with trees isn't the same issues that affect every single person in this community. This code, if it just wanted to allow anyone and everyone to be able to appeal a development order, you could cut out a lot of words. Those words are there for a reason. So I would implore the board, not only for the property owner who I represent, who's put a lot of effort into making their development order appeal, got it approved, and the only people seeking to challenge it are not adjoining property owners. No property owner near it is complaining. It's parties that do not have, have not met the standing requirements. So from my client's standpoint, it's a very big deal, but from a public policy standpoint, it's an equally big deal. Because if you allow it, you're going to be allowing standing by any third party any time a development order gets issued. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Donaway, did you have any closing remarks you would like to make, sir? No, Mr. Chairman. Thank, Thank you. you. 
Board members, any comments or questions? Chair would entertain a motion. I'll move that we approve the motion to dismiss for lack of standing, AP 2021-01. We have a motion. A second. We have a second. Any discussion? Could you please restate the motion to grant? Pardon? Would you state your The, the motion, motion is to approve. Is to grant. The move is. <laughs> Sorry. To grant. The, is to that grant. what you're stating as your motion? To grant when you say approve? It's a to motion to dismiss for lack of standing. Yes, it is. But he stated that he was would like to approve the motion. Are you you're stating your intent no, I'm, to I'm, grant I'm, the motion? Is that right? Grant. Grant the motion. Okay. Yes. Sorry. It's okay. We have a motion. We have a second. Any discussion? Those in favor signify by raising your right hand. Passes unanimously. Next case is Appeal 2021-02. Board members, has there been any ex parte communication regarding this case? Seeing none, does anyone have knowledge or information obtained from a site visit? Um, did you all want to disclose? Yeah. Yes. Okay. I didn't understand. I didn't hear. Uh, ex parte, the appearance of Miss Hofstetter on Friday. Oh, no. oh that, uh, yes. Thursday, Wednesday. The, the minutes reflect our ex parte communications involving uh, case uh, 2021 zero one with those board members. Zero two. <laughs> Second case. No, that was a one. When we did the ex parte disclosure no, we're now on o2 right right and uh, and you were reading in your introduction about ex parte communication and i think you all wanted to address that again for this Both. case yeah for this case mr chairman i'll move that our uh, disclosures in the previous case and the videotape from the subject hearing uh last wednesday be incorporated into this record relating to the subject of an ex parte communication by uh, Ms. Hofstetter to this board. Motion by Michael. Seconded. Second by Jennifer. Those in favor signify by raising your right hand. Passes unanimously. Would the individuals who are party to this item please come to the podium? Actually, we have a, an item uh, by Mr. Hoffman that should be introduced first. I apologize if you'll seat yourself again. I'll be brief. My basis to seek a intervention, be an intervening party for my client, is the same as the prior case you just heard. And we filed a motion to dismiss on that basis. But the initial matter you did at the prior hearing was to make a motion and approve um, the property owner um, intervening in this appeal as a interested party. Mr. Chairman, I'll move that we uh, admit Mr. Hoffman's client uh, accept uh, his client as an intervener in this action and make uh, that client uh, an official part of this proceeding. We have a motion. Do we have a second? I'll second. Any discussion? Those in favor, raise your right hand. Passes unanimously. 
We also had a motion to dismiss, but I don't want to take items out of order. Um, the county attorney had one as well. So I'll defer to whatever order you would like to hear those. You accept that order, is that my understanding? What's that? Well, there, there's two motions. Which one do you want to hear first? Because we, we filed a motion to dismiss on behalf of the property owner, which was um, it adopted all of the arguments made by the county attorney. Um, so we've got no issue with allowing her to go first and that then following that, in, that includes standing? Correct. Okay. That's what Okay. Said. Okay. Then I guess we don't need a motion. Okay, the applicant, please come to the podium. And I believe you have been sworn. Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, can I ask a procedural question on behalf of the DRC? Is she proceeding with her case in chief at this time? Because I have a motion to dismiss that's still pending. Yes, no, I'm agree. going to respond to the motion on the floor to dismiss. Well, I would like to make the motion first. Right. Okay. I was called. I'm sorry. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Frankly, standing is of even greater concern in this case than it was in the first. To remind the board, the applicant has the burden of proving that its interest differs in kind as opposed to degree from any adverse impact suffered by the community as a whole. Uh, specifically, the applicant is required to show special damages under the Renard decision. And Ms. Hostetter does not own, to my knowledge, any property anywhere near this site, so it is not possible for her to have any interest that suffers in kind different from any interest in this room or in Escambia County. Um, a finding that Ms. Hostetter had standing in this matter would essentially be the same result if you had found standing in the first case. It would mean that she could challenge any development order that was issued by the DRC regardless of where her property is located and how it relates to the subject site. So I would implore the board to consider the very strict standard that is outlined in the Renard decision and just understand that it is my belief she does not have the ability to show that her interest differs in kind from the community at large. Thank you. Okay, you've heard the motion. Would you like to come out? Yes. May I have the opportunity to make an opening statement first to sure. give my background? Absolutely. Thank you. <coughs> I am Margaret Hostetter, a business owner in the hospitality industry, and my husband and I are starting a new business, building an RV campground to host RV visitors to our area. I am not an attorney, but I have studied this matter extensively. I was born and raised in Pensacola lived in New Orleans, Dallas, Fort Lauderdale, where I was a realtor for many years. My husband, Kelly Moore, and I returned to Pensacola in 2009. About three years ago, I noticed the rapid growth boom and clear-cutting in new developments was very prominent. I began to study the effect of Escambia's tree canopy and found it's very detrimental. We're losing a lot of canopy. I began studying the county's land development code, especially pertaining to trees and developments. I visited developments under construction and I should say my husband and I, we worked together on all of this. I personally attended most of the weekly Wednesday afternoon DRC meetings and many of the county commission meetings. In reviewing 
and visiting new developments, I have personally seen and reported to local and state authorities several, several serious violations in new developments which, frankly, should have been noticed by the inspectors for the county or the state and the county staff. Mr. Chairman. There have been legal actions and fines paid and other serious matters uncovered directly resulting from my Hossetter, personal Ms. involvement Ms. in the citizen review process. Can you, can you please go get back to the facts? No, ma'am, I cannot. I am reporting to you who I am because I am going to be claiming stand, standing and other things. Okay. What and has this been is important. done is not who you are. Yes, okay. it is you who I am. You have explained who you are. Let's get back to the motion to dismiss. If you no, ma'am. I'm going to complete uh, the re reading of my introductory statement. Mr. Chairman, again, if... And, and I hate to keep on interjecting, but if the applicant refused to be governed and, and, and honor the request of a bill, a member. You're asking a, me to, con a, 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 to a, 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 you are I'm interrupting my no. presentation. Do you want me to get security? No, because, because we got to. I don't mind. We, we got to, Mr. Chairman, we got to citizens timing. We got to. The citizens that are here are here to because they want to protect the tree if ordinance. If answer the question, that is directed by this board. Many of those statements, I can comment on everything that she's saying. Excuse me, uh, Chair, Mr. Chairman. He has interrupted my presentation, and I would like to complete the introduction statement, the opening statement of who I am and why. I am here, and why uh, this is not my argument for standing, uh, that will be next. Mr. Chairman, if this is not her argument for standing. It's my it introduction needs, and opening statement, which I'm, I believe we need to gather to the point of what brought me to the place where I am an applicant. And that is my purpose. Please Mr. Chairman. allow me to continue. This is un reasonable that I am being interrupted when I have a three-page statement of which I am calling my um, opening statement I would like to complete. Three, three pages? Yes, sir. Please complete it. Thank you. I had just mentioned the very serious matters that I personally, as a citizen, reviewing developments have uncovered which resulted in fines and so forth from state uh, officials because developments were not properly reviewed and and uh, and so forth so i am very involved i was now may i continue as a result of the work that i have done in january of 2019 I formed a Facebook group called Trees of Escambia County, Florida, which now has over 700 members. And the mission of our Facebook group is to improve Escambia's tree ordinance. As a result, in 2019, Escambia began the process of having public input about tree matters and preparing to have the planning board consider and possibly recommend revisions to the land development code which would eventually go to the board of county commissioners for a vote to improve the tree ordinance then covid hit and halted the tree ordinance progress i was <laughs> and my husband very careful to stay home <laughs> and do the best we could to protect ourselves like so many others. But a few days, and therefore the progress of the official process that we were in to improve the county's tree ordinance halted. 
A few days before this particular A plus storage application was scheduled to be for final approval August 11th, I learned that the largest heritage oak tree measured by our county arborist, Jimmy Jarrett, Mr. an 85-inch in diameter, which is over 7 feet through the trunk and over 22 feet in circumference, plus 16 other protected trees Mr. Chairman. were scheduled Mr. to be Smith, removed. I believe we're getting into the argument. No, the we're case. not getting into the argument. I am going, please, the chairman has ruled that I may read my three pages, and that was page one. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I would uh, definitely but want to keep we'll, it we'll, to... We'll let her read these two pages, and that, that, that's it. Okay. We haven't even gotten, you're not going, you know, okay, pardon this, me. This is about it's, you, right. not about the case. Let's keep it to you. This is the case. No, ma'am. This, this is, is the opening a statement. You said that you wanted to make a statement of who you are. Of the okay. opening statement. This is about. You said about that you wanted to make it. You wanted to make a opening statement, so we know who you are. Thank you. The chairman has ruled that I can read the rest of my two pages. I learned just a few days, very few days, before the August 11th final hearing for this uh, development order about the situation where it would require the removal of the heritage tree, the largest known heritage tree by the county arborist, plus 16 other protected trees should it pass. Several, so I came to the meeting on August 11th, along with several members of the public who showed up at the DRC meeting. And during that meeting, there were questions of the development order and expressing concerns that our land development code was being violated by the approval of the a storage development order. Nonetheless, no questions or concerns were answered by the staff or the owner, Matt Bell, and his development engineer, Anthony Burkett, of David uh, Fitzpatrick Engineering, who were both in attendance that day. The process and purpose of the DRC's public hearing was completely ignored by Director Horace Jones. There were no answers, no discussion. Nothing was given supporting the decision by the director to approve the development order. We have a court transcript, I mean a court reporter's transcript provided by Mr. Dunaway of the entire meeting. So you can verify that is what happened. In response to the uh, approval with no explanation, no answers given on the 11th of August, I worked with some of our friends in the group and a change.org petition was started with the idea of encouraging everyone to protect that particular tree and the project. That petition now has over 5,500 signatures to save the D3 tree, we call it D3 meaning District 3 because it's in Lumen Mays District. People care. I would venture that 99% of the people who are here today who have had to leave, many of them, came because they care and they want to see this tree preserved and the integrity of our tree ordinance preserved. What we have is a weak land development code. We want to improve and protect our environment. Understanding the egregious error of the DRC decision that day on August 11th, under the direction of Horace Jones' leadership, by approving the Depor development order which violates the land development code regarding protected and heritage trees, I decided to file an appeal. 
I was the second filing. I knew Mr. Dunaway had previous, filed the previous day. I wish to overturn and shed light on what this process uh, was and how it was in error. And my appeal will expose that. I am prepared to present my case today, but I, I see the in writing on the wall that if you believe the arguments set forth in the question of standing, I won't have an opportunity to present one issue, one fact, one violation of our code. Okay, I'm sorry. We, I have three paragraphs left. Okay. Thank you, it, sir. <laughs> Mr. Chairman. I would like to note for the record that I had asked several times about the matter of standing of the staff and the procedure for determining standing and I was told that you members of the Board of Adjustment will vote on the matter of standing on the day of appeal. I would also like to state for the record that at the most recent development order appeal last October 2020 brought by Michelle Tyler against the Monarch Place subdivision development order, there was no vote by the Board of Adjustment or discussion about whether the applicant, Michelle Tyler, had standing before she was, present, before she was allowed to present her appeal. If it's necessary for the Board of Adjustment to vote on standing before the hearing, why was it not done in that appeal? And that's a, I'm not asking their answer, I am just informing you. Okay. I have prepared written responses for each motion to dismiss, the county motion to dismiss, and Mr. Hoffman, the interloper, the last minute intrusion on this case, uh, as to motions to dismiss. I have prepared both and I will present them in a bit. I do in fact have standing and I'll present that. My appeal will not only affect this development order and that would be the 17 protected trees heritage and others, but this issue that you will be deciding today is literally the test case in Escambia County for whether any, and I mean any, protected trees, meaning, protected meaning will be saved from removal, can be enforced. If the owner or developer wishes to have them removed, as this gentleman, Mr. Bell, did, against, clearly against the uh, language of the Land Development Code, then then we will have no uh, protected trees. That was my opening statement. Thank you. Thank you. And, and truly, I think everybody here appreciates your efforts to save the, save the trees. It's we not just this tree, sir, but no, thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much. Now, nice should I present now. my uh, response to the motion to dismiss for lack of standing by the county now? That was not it. No, it was not. That was my opening statement. Quit okay. laughing. This is serious. Again, we do have security yes. if you need them. I'm going to call for a point of order, and uh, we're going to allow. No, not a. No more outbreaks, or we'll dismiss this entire meeting. And. Uh, Board members, uh, any questions? Well, we we have your presentation. No, you don't, sir. I, 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 you're going. May I present now my response to the motion to dismiss for lack of standing? Sure. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, Chairman, I believe Horace. Did you want to say something? Yes, I'm. This, I'm the. Strong. Exactly. Yes, Horace, first of all, my name is Horace Jones. I am the director 
of the Development Services Department. My name has been mentioned out of order, out of sequence, and these by Ms. Hoster. We just want to say again that the, the process that she talked about coming to DRC, yes, as a concerned citizens only, as a concerned citizens. Again, I would suggest that the chairman, that we try to stay focused on the integrity of these proceedings. We do not want to establish a presidents for this board, a presidents for this board, because there will be other, other cases that may be challenged. This is the quasi-judicial board. We want to respect it so that other people who may come, they can know how to proceed in an orderly, respectable fashion. Emotions, this board got to be based upon facts, proceeding, proceedings, and the rule of law. So that's all I want to say. Let's respect the sanctity of these proceedings and the rule of law so that we can proceed with whatever, whatever decision because there are going to be some other things that's going to be stated that is going to be very inflammatory and not based upon facts. So let's stay with the motion at hand. I object to his uh, characterization of my motion and my statements as not being factual and being irrelevant and being emotional. I sincerely object. Mr. Chairman, I would like to remind everyone that we need to stick with the motion that is before us, not about the case itself. Absolutely. And uh, I do not want to hear any more information about the case until and unless we move forward with the actual case. Okay. And the, that is why I'm ready to present my uh, response to this di motion to dismiss for standing at this point. That, that's the motion. Yes. yes, sir. There are actually two motions, as you know. Um, one that came in on Friday at uh, 4.37 p.m. from Mr. Hoffman, who you allowed to present in this case, and one from the county assistant attorney, Kia Johnson. They both claim in one of the uh, points, so I will address this point which is in both cases uh, a part of their argument to dismiss. And I'm going to have to read this, I'm sorry, because <laughs> I wrote it and I'm afraid if I don't read it, I won't remember to get everything that I think I need to say. Regarding attorney Brian Hoffman's motion to dismiss, which also applies to Assistant County Attorney Kia Johnson's motion to dismiss for lack of standing. Mr. Hoffman said to deny because it, I make no reference to explain how appealing party has standing, which is an express requirement specifically in LDC section 2-6.10b3, that is part of his claim. My response to Mr. Hoffman is, I do not have to assert my standing in the application that I presented on the 15th day, the last day, August 20, I mean, um, yeah, August 26th, the last day one could apply to appeal. I applied on the last day with the appropriate forms and statements in the application packet, as well as my personal check for $682.60. 
Plus, I have spent over $100 in document fees for requested information from the county. And many of those documents, in fact all of them, I didn't even receive or begin to receive until, August, until about a week after I had made the appeal application. I'm sure you all realize that in the application, it is not necessary to present my entire case, to present why I have standing. That is what you do today, here. But that is what Mr. Hoffman is claiming. LDC section 2-6.10B1 says, application does not require that I state the basis I have for claiming standing. Therefore, it was not required to include in the application packet along with my $682.60 check. Now, Land Development Code Section 2-6.10B3, Standing. And as you can see up there, please bring it up, 2-6.10B3, Is it there? Yes, ma'am. It's highlighted. Do you all see this on your screen as well? Because I'm sure you can't we see that. It. I can't see it hardly. Yeah, we have it. All right. Which reads, although the hearing before the BOA is open to the public, only those person or entities withstanding will be allowed to present testimony or other evidence during the hearing. And then it says, persons withstanding include, and there's A and B. A is the applicant. I am the applicant of one of the two appeals. Or another, any, any, any other person who received the adverse decision from the county administrative official is required in order to be allowed to present testimony or other evidence during the hearing. B would be another category for standing. Those persons who are third parties to the administrative decision and who suffered an adverse impact that differs in kind as opposed to degree to any adverse impact suffered by the community as a whole, which is the argument that Ms. Kia Johnson has used in saying you should dismiss me as you did Mr. Dunaway's client. But I am going to show you that I am not the third party only. I am also the applicant, and as such, I have standing. I have standing in both ways, in A as the applicant and B in third party, but I only need to prove one of those methods for having and, uh, standing, and by having standing uh, granted to me today, I will then be able to present my case, which is the whole purpose of this, of this uh, um, exercise in determining if I have standing. First, as to A, A, I am one of two separate applicants bringing an appeal to the same development order. The term applicant is crucial. In section 2-10. Pardon me. In section 2-6.10 is not explained or specified as being anyone in particular. 
The Land Development Code definition in Chapter 10, I mean, pardon me, in definitions are in Chapter 6, is this, quote, applicant, any person, including any person, including the person's agent who submits an application to the county requesting development approval. That would be Mr. Uh, Bell and his attorney. Or, or other consideration according to any of the compliance review processes described by the LDC. I contend that I am an applicant, one of the two, <coughs> because I submitted an application to the county requesting not a development approval like the owner did, but I, can, I submitted other consideration according to any of the compliance review processes prescribed by the LDC. The other consideration was my appeal of an administrative decision. It is what is referred to as other consideration in the compliance review section 2-6.10 paren 4. Also, if you would scroll down to um, the context of this area in, of the code, there are other three other specific places where the term applicant is used, and it dis, dis expressly is not referring to Mr. Bell, the applicant for the development order. It's referring to me, the word applicant. Please look at 2 6 10 4. And I wish I could see it better. I'm going to have to go over here. Two dash six dot ten four. Okay, I'm going to read this. Compliance review. The BOA shall conduct the quasi judicial public hearing to consider the appeal of an administrative decision. The applicant has the burden of presenting competent, substantial evidence to the board that establishes each of the following conditions with regard to the decision being appealed. You see, I am the applicant. I am going to bring those um, competent arguments as to the appeal I have made. Please scroll down now to 2-6.10 paren 4E. Greater impact. The adverse impact adversely affects the applicant in a degree greater, in a greater degree than any adverse impact shared by the community at large. And if the applicant is a third party to the decision, the adverse impact peculiar to the applicant differs in kind as opposed to degree to any suffered by the community as a whole. Again, the word applicant clearly is indicating the person bringing the application, not Mr. Bell, me. The third example of why I am an applicant is 2-6.105A. Final determination, board finding. If the BOA finds from the record of the hearing that the applicant has presented competent, substantial evidence proving the required conditions set out in the comprehensive review provisions of this section, the board shall find the appealed decision in error. 
the findings shall state with particular particularity how the decision of the administrative official was arbitrary or capricious. If the conditions are not proven, the board shall affirm the decision. Who is the applicant? I am. The BOA will find from the record of the hearing, which we haven't even gotten to yet, the hearing, that the applicant has presented competent, substantial evidence. I am the applicant. So, the first requirement, or the first, back to the original 2-6.10b3. Where it says, persons with standing include a applicant. And then b, which describes others and refers to them as third parties. Now, I hope this information has shown that my claim to be having standing is true by what I've just presented, because that is my contention, that I have standing because I'm the applicant, and the applicant is not Mr. Bell in this hearing. But should you disagree with my contention and believe that the county's assistant attorney, Ms. Johnson, is correct that I'm only a third party, I would be happy to address that. May I? Uh, but then there's another thing that Mr. Uh, Hoffman had asserted in his motion to dismiss, and I would like to mention that. Um, because I think we want to dismiss Mr. Hoffman's motion to dismiss, and this should do it. As I said, I received in an email at 4.58 my, Friday, Mr. Hoffman's motion to dismiss my presentation, my hearing. He is Mr. Bell, Matt Bell's attorney. He claimed that my application should be dismissed because, I mean his second com reason, uh, is because on August 11th, 2021, which was the date of the DRC final application hearing and when this uh, pro development order was approved. When I was making a statement as a member of the public, one of many who spoke on the issue that day, and um, I was, um, asking, I was expressing why I thought the decision to approve uh, the development order was an error, as many others were, including Mr. Dunaway, who was there. I was interrupted in my presentation, as is not unusual, by division manager Andrew Holmer. This is in the record, it's in the transcript, I've got the line and so forth. I'll give it to you later if you need it. And he said this, ma'am, the avenue for appeal of the administrative decision is through the County Board of Adjustment. If the DO is signed, you will have 15 days to file an appeal. And I answered and said, sarcastically, quote, if I have standing, which I probably don't, may I continue? May I continue addressing the, uh, the, the statement I was making? And 
I made that statement, and I'll repeat it, if I have standing, which I probably don't. And I said it sarcastically. I made that statement in an ironic way, intending to mock or convey contempt, which is the definition of sarcastically. My statement was just that, sarcasm. I was not under oath testifying or even testifying in this or any quasi-judicial hearing, but rather as an ordinary citizen presenting my objections and questions to the DRC at what is supposed to be a public hearing before they sign these final development orders. And in fact, one of the things that I can prove, that this in fact proves, is that this, this development order should be nullified for many reasons, but one is process. The process includes that the, that the hearing, the final hearing on that day when so many citizens came out as I did, and as Mr. Dunaway did, to object to this uh, decision, is expressly required by this process to have had an answer or answers from the staff to our questions of how is this in keeping with the code, what you are deciding here today. No answers, no questions, no, no discussion even was given. I suspected that if I were to file an appeal in the, in the county, that they would, the county would try to defeat my appeal from the start as they are doing by claiming I do not have standing. And indeed, that's what they have done. Before I even get to the Board of Adjustment hearing to present my arguments as to why I do in fact have standing or what the merits of my case appealing the decision are. At that point on August 11th, I had gotten no answers from staff about what constitutes standing and I understood they expected it to be a hurdle. I could not clear if I brought an appeal. Director Jones taunted me on the phone and said more than once, quote, you can appeal. Just as division manager Andrew Homer did during my presentation at the DRC meeting on August 11th when he interrupted and said that. And it's on page eight of the transcript lines 16 through 19, his, Mr. Homer's statement. Again, what he said, ma'am, he interrupted my statement, ma'am, the avenue for appeal of the administrative decision is through the County Board of Adjustment. If the DO is signed, you will have 15 days to file an appeal. Mr. Hoffman claims that I stated in that meeting, I do not have standing, and therefore I am to be held to that, uh, to that uh, degree with you here today. He's saying, she said she didn't have standing. She can't change her mind. She said she didn't have standing. She can't come before the board and claim she has standing. Again, I was not under oath. I was speaking sarcastically. I indeed have standing. I'd like to have you recognize the kind of obstacles that have been presented here. 
Mr. Huffman's motion to dismiss should be dismissed. Now continuing with the county attorney, assistant attorney Kia Johnson's motion to dismiss for lack of standing. She also claimed it should be dismissed, my, my opportunity to bring the uh, uh, case to appeal which we haven't even begun to discuss the facts of the appeal, and the, that's the purpose of this hearing. And we won't unless you give me the right to by understanding and agreeing that I have standing, and I've proven I have standing here today. But she has claimed, just like she did for Mr. Dunaway's client, that I'm a third party to the administrative decision on appeal. And she claims as such, I have the burden of establishing two items of standing. Number one, applicant's property will suffer an adverse impact as a result of the decision if it is not modified. And two, that the adverse impact peculiar to the applicant, me, She's calling me an applicant here. I am the applicant. You can't have it both ways, Ms. Johnson. I can't be called by you in your own case for dismissing the applicant and then defined more narrowly as a third party applicant, which has to have a much higher standard for being considered uh, uh, having standing. So let me repeat number two, that the adverse impact peculiar to the applicant, me, differs in kind as opposed to degree to any, any adverse impact suffered by the community as a whole. In other words, a third party appealing an administrative decision decision must allege and prove special damages. Like Mr. Dunaway said, who could ever prove that? Again, if I were to be considered only a third party and not the applicant, as I contend, I claim that I also have standing as a third party under this provision, an aggrieved third party. LDC section 2-1.4, comprehensive review, paren D, appeal, reads, Quote, any LDC compliance review applicant or other, see, I am the applicant, but it also refers to other aggrieved parties as defined by Florida law may appeal either the applicant or other aggrieved parties may, as defined by Florida law, may appeal the decision of an administrative official or board in their administration of the LDC as prescribed in this chapter. Here is the reference to the state law. Florida statute title 11-163. Dot 3215, standing to enforce local comprehensive plans through development orders. Number two, aggrieved or adversely affected party means any person or local government which will suffer an adverse effect, an, A, 
in adverse effect to an interest protected or furthered by the local government comprehensive plan, including interests related to, I'm doing dot, 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 because it lists many examples of interest that are related, that would be uh, involved in this kind of a protection or would generate aggrieved parties. And the last in the list of me, you know, people who are aggrieved are those who are, who have interests, interests related to environmental or natural resources. The alleged adverse interest may be shared in common with other members of the community as lar at large, but shall exceed in degree the general interest in community goods shared by all persons. This contradicts the language of the county's code. This contradicts what you based your decision to dismiss Mr. Dunaway's case on, and this law is Florida statute. It supersedes your county ordinance. We're not talking about different in kind for a third party or if they're aggrieved. We're talking about difference in degree. As I said, I'm mentioning this because that is the argument Ms. Johnson gave, so I'm giving you my response to uh, if I were not to have standing because I'm a third party. I have met the criteria for standing, whether it be as the applicant, which I claim and contend, or if I, you were to determine that I only am a third party. Now I want to continue with the last paragraph in this Florida statute. Further, it says, number eight, in any suit under this section, the Department of Legal Affairs may intervene to represent the interests of the state. The interests of the state are at stake here. Whose rules and laws supersede? Who, the state or the county? The language differs. And that's why further in my information and discussion in the hearing, I'm going to mention other matters that seem to conflict with the law of the state and in fact the government of the United States, constitutional law. So I believe this one presentation on why I have standing as the applicant and I refute the, the uh, basis for the dismissal by the county that I'm only a third party, and I refute the basis for dismissal by Mr. Hoffman that I have said that I don't have standing. I think I have expressed that clearly. So this document that I have just read from, my reply to the question and the motion to deny and dis actually not deny, dismiss the whole case before we even have a chance to say anything about the matter of the development order and was it proper. This document, my reply to both the Assistant County Attorney Kia Johnson's motion to dismiss for lack of standing and likewise the owner, Matt Bell's attorney, Brian Hoffman's motion to dismiss. I ask that you do not dismiss that I do have standing and that you allow me to proceed with the hearing, to start the hearing on the facts of the appeal.
And if for some reason you, who are not lawyers, except maybe you are, sir, <laughs> you are, okay. Um, I'm certainly not. <clears throat> But if there is a question of whether I have standing, let me present my case. That can be answered later. This is a quasi-judicial hearing. There is no judge to present or to ask this, to refer to for a clarification on this serious and crucial point. So if you should vote, well, I don't even know if you should vote, but if you um, felt or voted that I don't have standing, hopefully when you vote, you'll vote that I'm correct. I have proven I have standing and can proceed. And I also want to point out that the attorney for your board and Ms. Johnson, who are giving you legal advice, are prejudiced and biased because they represent the county the entity that I am bringing this appeal against. So if you do not vote uh, or, or in my favor for standing, I plead with you to let me present my case. And then whomever is the authority on whether you have, in fact, made the correct or incorrect decision about my motion for standing, that would then decide at a later date when maybe a judge can rule on this question of standing whether I should have ever brought my case. I hope this makes sense. I know the community with over 5,500 people who have signed this petition and honesty and integrity and transparency and following our own land development code, which is the issue here in the hearing, needs to be held. The appeal needs to be heard. Does that make sense? I think now is the time for me to sit down. I am prepared to continue with the actual hearing if you will allow by voting to accept my standing as I've, com as I've expressed. Do you have any questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. <laughs> Ms. Johnson, do you have any closing yeah. remarks? Yes, just briefly before Mr. Hoffman presents his motion, the DRC does not dispute that Ms. Hostetter is an applicant. She is an applicant. She's a third party applicant for appeal of this de development order. As a third party, of course, she has the burden of establishing that she will suffer an adverse impact that differs in kind as opposed to degree to any adverse impact suffered by the community as a whole. Ms. Hostetter quoted at length Florida statute 163.3215. However, that statute is not relevant to this proceeding. It sets forth a different standard of standing, which is much more liberal than the strict standard that is articulated in the Land Development Code and which was adopted from the Renard decision of special damages. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Board members, any questions? Seeing none, uh, what we're talking about here is a motion uh, to dismiss for lack of standing. I think, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Hoffman, if he has any additional remarks, we, we could hear him now at this point. Thank you. Um, just to recap what Ms. Johnson stated, her position as far as the applicant is correct. If the, appell if the appealing party if their definition of applicant is as she states, then there would be standing for everyone. And they've already, you've already clarified that when you went through the last appeal. That's not a viable basis. It has to be able to show a unique interest. And as to the statement that was made, it's very clear that that is one based upon degree. In fact, Ms. Hostetter pretty much states that in the conclusion when she states that 
she believes the standard 2B degree. Well, it's not. Your, the land development code is clear. It has to be in kind. And when she explained what those damages were about the tree canopy, for the same reasons that Emerald Coast Keepers had made their argument, that affects everyone in the community um, the same. Specific to the motion to dismiss that we have filed, uh, the property owner, the statement is clear from the record by the applicant, by Ms. Hostetter, that she doesn't have standing. Now, the argument being given is, well, you need to read sarcasm into a transcript. That's not how it works. And if that's how it worked on appeal, when you have a deposition transcript that somehow you inferred sarcasm or the words don't mean what they state, it would be chaos from a court. And this is essentially acting as a court. She makes a statement that she doesn't have standing. And then when she filed the appeal, makes no reason to explain how that position's now changed. The law that's been cited in our motion is clear. You are bound by your statements in a court and in the proceedings. And in this case, she made reference to the judge. The four of you are acting as a judge in this case. It's quasi-judicial, but your role is the same as a judge. And for that reason, the issue of standing has already been conceded. Even if you don't accept that argument, though, the very basis for why standing has been offered to you is exactly the same as the prior appeal you just listened to. And all the reasons why standing should not be adopted when a third party cannot show in kind and they're not a property owner, those are the same for this appeal as well. The only final comment I'll make is that opening statement w was troubling for a lot of reasons because, you know, Mr. Homer, Mr. Jones, both attorneys, both of whom I've known, I've worked with in other matters before, get deemed and pegged to be prejudicial when all they're doing is doing their job. Same for county staff. No one person in this room drafted the land development code. Not the attorneys, not Mr. Jones, not Mr. Homer. And we now have someone who's coming who doesn't have standing, who's basically using this podium as a means to attack county staff for doing their job. That's not what this appeal's for. And if someone from the general public came and tried to do that to the four of you, the response would be the same. That's the very reason where if this matter is going to come before this board, those standing requirements are, very, are there for a reason. They're there to protect the process. And an opening statement that just blindly attacks county staff and the two attorneys is not appropriate, and it's not what this process is for. I object to his going into anything other than the position we are addressing, which is the motion to dismiss. The Actually, ma'am, you opened the door uh, when you made those statements. In the opening statement? Yes, ma'am. That ma was a separate statement no, from my discussion it doesn't, on the motion. No, ma'am, it doesn't work like that. Uh, okay, that's fine. I can address when he finishes his comments and refute them. The county staff did their job. They didn't draft the land development code. The attorneys here for your board and for the county are doing their job. They didn't draft the land development code. And the four of you sitting there right now are doing your job as far as the standing requirements under the code. That's different from interpreting facts the way we want. It's, it's a hard role. I mean, to be honest, the, the role you play actually enforcing the land development code as written is difficult. But for all the reasons that the prior appeal just got dismissed, those same ones apply here and more so because if you actually look at the record, the appealing party has conceded that she does not have standing. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Again, I went through very carefully, very precisely, very specifically the ways in which the code and its clear reading indicate that I am the applicant and that the applicant, by definition, has standing. Whether or not I'm a third party is irrelevant. I am the applicant. The applicant is not Mr. Bell. The applicant for the appeal is who I am. We are here to review and to consider a hearing brought about by an appeal. I am the applicant. And under this rule, these rules, the applicant, which I am, has, to do, has a standard to prove their case, which I haven't even begun my case, 
but the proper, my standard would be to what degree I am uh, affected. And when we get to my case, I can clearly expound on that. I am not a third party in my opinion, in the opinion that I read and expressed to you from the law and from our, your own uh, reading of your own land development code. So in either case, I should be heard. I do have standing. But as I said, if for some reason you're confused, <laughs> this is complex. This is extremely complex. And what is it that we're putting up such a fight and going into such minutia over? When the last development order you heard was over a year, was a year ago, October of 2020, and the question was never even raised. The issue was not even brought up of whether that applicant had standing. No mention was made of it. It was not an issue. You see? Please give me the opportunity to present my case, my information, the facts, and if you believe uh, for some reason that I am not the applicant, that I don't have standing, the right to bring this case, I will have brought it, and then the appeal, should there be one, and as Mr. Dunaway said, this is an outrageously expensive uh, uh, undertaking for anyone anyone to make an appeal at this level. The amount of time, effort, energy, money, personal sacrifice, etc., that I have gone to, what, the, uh, what Mr. Dunaway and his team and his client have, have gone through. And you won't even hear us? I presume, that's why I spoke in, in his uh, standing hearing, because I knew that this would be the argument that they would make. Oh, you turned him down. She's the same. But I'm, I believe I have gone further into explaining why I have standing. And you hopefully have read, as I read it to you, and understood that I do. Please let me present the information on the appeal during the hearing. Don't shut this off. It isn't, it isn't due process. It isn't right. And um, not only is this particular A-plus heritage oak tree the largest measured to date back in December of 2020, in the county by a county arborist, going to be removed. But there are 16 other so-called protected trees that will be removed because this development order, which had been approved, violating the land development code procedures, requirements, and the process and procedure by which this all came about that I will present in my hearing, means it will, if, if not given an opportunity to be heard, if not given an opportunity to give the staff correct, you know, correct the staff and their process and their decisions, then no tree of any protected or heritage size in this county will ever be preserved or Ms. protected. Hostetter, unless, Hostetter, unless can the... Can I ask you a question? No, I'm finishing. Just I, I can't ask unless you a question? I don't know who that is even. It's All me. All right. Well, I've got to let me make my statement and then I'll answer your question. Uh, no, ma'am. Unless I have this a is preserved, I need you to answer no, it as relates to no the tree standing. will be saved. Ma'am, unless are you the going owner, to the question you're interrupting or not? me, ma'am. Are you going to answer me or no, not? No, I don't want to listen to you right now. I'm making my last sentence. I'm asking you nope, a question. Nope, I'm not answering your question. I am Mr. speaking Chairman. and I'm making my last Chairman, sentence. Chairman, Mr. Arby, Mr. Arby. My Mr. last Arby. sentence is Chairman. that we I to, believe that if this is not overturned, no tree will be able to be protected unless the owner wants to save it. 
that is exactly what happened in this case. The owner dictated the decision that he would not remove or reduce the size of his building to, compens to, a, to uh, afford the tree, the heritage tree in particular, to remain. He refused. Who is the decision maker? Who regulates the developments? The owner themselves, as in this case, okay, or the staff and the I've rules? Given you every, you sure every have. Thank you, sir. Thank You're you. Welcome. You're welcome. And again, we appreciate your concern for our natural resources. Thank you very much. Uh, board members, any questions? Seeing none, the chair will entertain a motion. I'll entertain a motion uh, because she refused to answer my question. Um, I uh, move to, to grant the motion to dismiss for lack of standing. I'd be glad to answer your question No, I'm sorry, ma'am. You've had enough. I wanted to finish my statement okay. and not be interrupted. That was the crucial no. sentence. No what way. was your question? You, you're no. out of order now. You're really out of order. Uh, she, she basing a, refuse, a motion on my I'm not answering a question. order. I think she's out of order for interrupting me during my presentation. And now, if she would like to ask me the question, before making an assumptive motion, I'd be happy to try and answer it. What is your question? It's not, no, that's not necessary. There's no more, no more, no more questions. Well, then sh why is she we, basing we have, a statement for a motion, motion on the question I didn't answer? Mr. Chairman, I'll second. The we have a motion. We have a second. Uh, any further discussion? Those in favor signify by raising your right hand. Passes unanimously. There are no more items before the board for this meeting, sir. Stormer, what was that I didn't hear? Did say? There's, there's no more items. It was just the two cases. Okay. Do we have a hearings next month? Uh, one conditional use for the next meeting. One conditional use. Okay. These hearings are over. The case wasn't opened.